They're not out there. <laughs> this is the board meeting for Wednesday, October 9th, 2019. And when we go back in to our closed session, we will do 2.1 expulsion referral. We have three. 2.2 certificate of public employee appointment by 4957. 2.3 classified public employee appointment appoint, <laughs> appointment appointment. <laughs> 54957 again. 2.4 negotiations update. 2.5 public employee discipline dismissal release leaves. 2.6 existing pending anticipated lit litigation. And that's it. <coughs> what is this? It's American School Board Journal. Wow, I've never seen this thing before. Wow. That's the American Yeah, there is a woman over there. Beautiful. She's talented. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our board meeting for October 9th, 2019. Bienvenidos a la Junta de Nuestra Mesa Directiva para el 9 de octubre 2019. Um, so I'm going to ask our new... <laughs> Our new representative on the board, student representative Renee, Stella Renee, to lead us on Pledge of Allegiance. Oh. It's right here. This day. I know. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ready, salute. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of, of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Este, we have a translator here, Virginia Gonzalez. Tenemos una traductora aquí, se llama Virginia Gonzalez. <laughs> So if you need um, translation, see her. Si necesitas um, que ella le ayuda con las uh, traducciones, se puede hablar con ella. Um, so if someone would like to speak on an item in the agenda, we have quite a few of them already here. Yep. <laughs> they just need to get a speaker card and they are yellow <laughs> tonight. <laughs> you need to get a yellow speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria, there she is. Um, and each speaker will have two minutes. Este, si quieres hablar en la agenda, tienes que conseguir una tarjetita a María y uh, poner lo que quieres decir y darlo a Eva. Y tiene dos, minut dos minutos para hablar. Okay. Um, Before I, um, oh, I have a new one. <laughs> um, before I have Dr. Rodriguez speak, um, I wanted to tell you that, I wanted to invite all of you, if you could come, to, um, there's going to be a fundraiser at Carmona's in Watsonville. Everybody knows where that is, right? <laughs> Carmona's is a wonderful place over on East Lake. Um, they're going to have a fundraiser for the Pajaro Valley High School um, sports teams, I think, you, I think mostly women too, to, in order to buy new jerseys. Their jerseys are very old. Um, and it's going to be from 7 o'clock until 10 o'clock. So all of, these, all of you who are able to come and benefit Pajaro Valley High School, please do. Um, Tomorrow. It's tomorrow, Thursday. Tomorrow, Thursday. Okay, <laughs> sorry if I didn't say that. It's tomorrow, Thursday. <laughs> it's 
sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the superintendent is going to have comments, but she's also going to have a very special guest here with her tonight, with us tonight. And I want to say to you that he is here because of his deep support for Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. He's here because of that. So, Dr. Rodriguez, your are Thank you. So we've had a busy couple of weeks. Um, so as you know, I hold a day in the life each month. So I held another day in the life on September 17th. And there I am as a food service worker at MSD Elementary. So it's always wonderful to see the connection um, that Maria Rodriguez has with her students. Um, they love her and know that she's there for them, not only to provide healthy food, um, but also a loving hug. And so thank you to Maria for her dedication. So hemos tenido un par de semanas muy ocupadas. Como ustedes saben, cada mes hago un día en la vida de, y este 17 de septiembre tuve la oportunidad de tener otro día de la vida como una trabajador de servicios de alimentos. Y estaba en la escuela Amesti. Fue maravilloso ver la conexión que María Rodríguez tiene con sus estudiantes. Lastimen en saben que él no solamente da comida saludable a ellos, pero también un abrazo um, amoroso. So gracias a María por su dedicación. So yesterday we began our monthly celebration of staff um, that is showing their school and our community um, that they're all in every day. So we celebrated, and there she is, if you can do the next picture, um, celebrated Ronnie De La Peña, who is a 2-3 combination teacher at Starlight Elementary. And we recognized her in front of her class with a flowering plant and also an all-in every day shirt. So ayer comencemos nuestra celebración semanal de personal que muestra su escuela y también la comunidad que está presente, que está presente y con ganas todos los días. Celebramos a Rani de la Peña, um, una maestra con una combinación de segundo y tercer grado en la escuela primaria de Starlight. So la reconocimos en frente de su clase con una planta um, y también una camisa de All In Every Day. And so now I'd like to introduce a very special guest, um, Edward James Almos, who really needs no introduction. Um, but he's going <laughs> to say a few words regarding our partnership with the district um, on our initiative, um, Youth Cinema Project. So ahora me gustaría presentar a un invitado muy especial. So Ed, Edward James almost que no necesita presentación, pero él va a dar unas palabras con respeto de nuestra um, asociación con el distrito en nuestra iniciativa de proyecto de cinema juvenil. So Eddie James almost. Todavía no está puesto, ahí está, perfecto. Muchas gracias, es un honor y un placer estar aquí con todos ustedes. No saben el gusto, el orgullo que tengo estar aquí. Especialmente, doctora Rodríguez, muchas gracias por todo lo que hace usted para toda la comunidad, pero especialmente para los niños. Every single one of you. I'm going to start crying, ¿ok? Voy a comenzar a llorar. Es el, es el punto de llorar. No. I'm emotional because you're doing things here that you must know uh, the impact that it's had, and you must know how incredible this has been for your kids mm -hmm. in a way that it's unprecedented. I know that a lot of you have uh, received this, but I'm going to give it to you at a hard copy. Bodhi, would you do me a favor and pass them out real quick along the top? Uh, Bodhi, uh, will be my son, will be passing out this. Nice to meet you, son. This, yes, this is my son, <laughs> Bodhi, almost. He's also the manager of the Youth Cinema Project, and he's the one that everybody really knows. Now, the reason I had these to you is because, don't, don't try to read them right now, but take them with you and just know, this is the brief assessment of the Youth Cinema Project 
from your schools. And they are the most unprecedented assessments done on 21st century teaching that Stanford University has presented. I didn't say that, they said it in the book, all right? Mm -hmm. And I say, to, yeah, I would applaud that too, honestly. <laughs> because they come from your children. They come from your schools. This has been an unbelievable moment in time. And I will say this right now, I'd like to bring up Principal Jacqueline Medina, who is the principal of Starlight. And I'd like to bring up also Lucy Basar, who's the, one of the great teachers there. <laughs> and, and Angela Taigan, stand over here with me. Angela and, and uh, Francesa Chavez Francesa Middle Chavez. School. All I will say is these, these people are the ones who deserve our thanks. <laughs> They're the ones who make it possible for us to understand this moment in time. Because what I'm telling you right now is something that nowhere else in the United States of America are they experiencing this moment. Just in the state of California, there are 1,400 kids that are involved in the program as of right now. It's been going on since 1998, and we've slowly rolled it out, and now we are in here with you and moving forward very strongly. I thank every single one of you for giving the opportunity for your kids to understand what this is all about. The Youth Cinema Project brings about a total understanding, a total understanding of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity to the highest level. We start in the fourth grade, don't we? And what happens to the children when they get into this program quickly? <laughs> just tell them quickly, do it quick. Um, it's just a really exciting opportunity for them to learn in a different way. It's true project-based learning. Um, it's very, it gives access to students from, you know, students come from all different backgrounds and different, they have their different strengths and challenges and um, everybody's able to come together and really grow throughout this program. and. Um, and learn, and I've, I've just seen a lot of growth from students who, you know, the quietest students be able to step up and grow and um, end up creating a short film by the end of the year. It's special. <laughs> and the problem, I mean, the problems that they face going into the fourth grade are monumental. Mm -hmm. Every single one of you remembers the fourth grade, mm -hmm. even though you don't really remember it. <laughs> because why? Because coming out of the third grade, most of us were not ready for the fourth grade. <laughs> we weren't up to the reading capacity or mathematic capacity or s whatever study we were doing in the third grade. And so we were really scared when we walked in the fourth grade. Well, this program attacks them in a way that allows them to become filled with self-esteem, self-respect, and self-worth to the highest level. If we only did it in the fourth grade, it would be monumental. And we have to do it. We are, we are determined to get this into every single fourth grade in public schools in the United States of America. And if we can do what you're doing, which is now you have it in grammar school, you have it in junior high, and God willing, you will understand what Santa Ana Unified School District understood. They put it into their high school. So we went from fourth grade to fifth, and now we are, uh, you're teaching, you're teaching sixth. Come here and tell them what happened to the students that you got that had been in the program before you got them. Um, so this year I have students who half of them have done YCP for three years or this is their third year and I'm finding that they're stepping up being leaders to the students who haven't done it yet. So um, for the first year students, they're getting a lot of help and advice. I have two students that are mine this year that were fourth, um, one did it in fourth and fifth grade and one first year student this year. And it's really awesome to see them step up and share um, their ideas, their background, their knowledge, but also learn so many life skills, um, how to work as a team, how to cooperate through the ups and the downs. Um, so it's just awesome to see them grow throughout the year, like Ms. Tigan said, you know, kind of get out of their shell, but also build that self-confidence in something that isn't just academics. The key to the whole thing is who administers the coordination and the understanding. And this woman, I honestly tell you, Jacqueline deserves our strongest thank yous because she's the principal of the grammar school.
please come over here and say what happens to these kids. <laughs> You're so sweet. Uh, well, one thing I want to comment on is we're all in every day, right? That's our theme. And um, we've noticed that the authentic learning experiences that Dr. Rodriguez has supported and the work that Mr. Olmos is bringing to our district is bringing kids every day. They, they're, we were talking earlier how kids will come to their film class and then make their dentist appointments afterwards. And we're like, we still want them there all, you know, all day. But they, this is one of the draws that's bringing them there. And we see the benefit every day. So thank you. We went from six, uh, we were losing 400 students in the last, and uh, f five years ago we lost up to uh, 400 students in Santa Ana Unified School District. We placed the program in there. Within three years, 600 returned. That is what the public school systems need. Mm -hmm. That's what we represent. Mm -hmm. Life, liberty, happiness. And we can only get it if we're educated. And you are giving us that opportunity. You gave it to us in such a strong way. The Stanford University's assessment program is the strongest assessment program for PhDs in the world. Mm -hmm. Read what you guys did. Read it and understand it and marry it and understand what Santa Ana did. Santa Ana turned around and brought it into the high school. And what happened when they brought it into the high school, from grammar school, junior high and high school, the kids were so well prepared that um, uh, university uh, named Chapman. Chapman. <laughs> Chapman University in Santa Ana gave is giving 10 scholarships per year, full ride scholarships, not that they have to be filmmakers. No, no, in anything they want to be in. It's the student that gets out of this program. The self-esteem, self-respect, and self-worth is so high. Their ability to communicate, their ability to understand, watch this, this was not expected, watch this. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here. Come here. Just tell them what you do in that class. What do you do? You we write, write our script, mm -hmm. and we write our stories, and hopefully you will get chosen one day. <laughs> well, what happens to the chosen one? They film it. They get that opportunity. What, what did you do in the class? What, w what was your uh, position in the, in the crew? It's my first year. Well, what, are you, what do you want to be? Have you learned any positions yet? Yes. What, what would you like to be? The producer, maybe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you're seeing a producer. <laughs> now, I don't know much about anything. I really don't. I wish I did. But I can honestly tell you right now, I do understand human behavior. And I understand what this means. I understand what this means. <laughs> I understand what this means. <laughs> and I understand what this means. Con la baba cayéndose la boca. Every single one of us exposes ourselves every single minute. We look at each other and we're giving everything and we don't even know it. So I say to all of you, always give the best of yourself, especially when it comes to our children. I love you, Dr. Rodriguez. You've come a long way with me, and I tell you right now, I'm sorry I took so much time, but I gotta tell you, you are all very, very fortunate to live in this community. And you better pray that you can get them to advance in every single fourth grade, in all of your schools, in all of the district, into your classrooms because this makes the biggest difference in the history of teaching in the 21st century. There's nothing like it. That's what, not me saying it, that's what Stanford Assessment Programs stated. God bless you all for doing this for the children. Thank you.
Boy. Collapse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, we should go up to here. Um, so I'm going to do the oath of office <laughs> for Stella Renee Guerra. <laughs> okay, so I, Karen Osmussen, President of the Board of Trustees of PVUSD, do hereby certify that Ms. Sierra um, was officially selected among many, I will say, <laughs> as student trustee as, as the October 9th meeting of the board. Okay, here's your oath. <laughs> Ready? Yes. <laughs> okay. I, Stella Renee Sierra, do solemnly swear. I, Stella Renee Sierra, do solemnly swear. <laughs> that I will defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I defend the Constitution of the State and the United States. Of the United States and, and of California. Correct. <laughs> Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will be, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution. That I will bear true allegiance and and faith, true faith, faith to the Constitution. To the Constitution. That's okay. <laughs> Of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Of the Constitution and the, Uni Uni the United oh, States. Of the United States. And the State of California. And the State of California. <laughs> that I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. <laughs> without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will will faithfully discharge the duties I can help you with that and uh, that I will well and faithfully that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties <laughs> upon which I am about to enter upon which I am about to enter <laughs> <laughs> Presented this day, October 9th. <laughs> okay. Now we have our board comments. Um, do you want to start with Georgia? Thank you, Karen. Um, that was a hard act to follow with Sir Senior Amos, but um, I'm going to just comment on this because I get to, um, I recall being at a CSBA conference with our superintendent, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, and um, we got to witness a performance um, from students um, from another school district in the state from his program. And after it was over, I just turned to her and I looked at her and I go, man, we need to get that. And she's like, I'm working on it. And so I just like to commend her for her work in getting that and bringing that to our district and, and expanding it. And hopefully it does continue to expand. Great job, Dr. Rodriguez, with that. Thank you. Um, I, I, just a few other quick comments from me. Um, I want to thank our PV High students. A few weekends ago, my family and I were out and we did the second um, annual Little Wharf race. And PV High students were out there volunteering, helping set up that race at 5.30 in the morning and helping to break it down. And so many of these races 
go back into our local community, into our programs in our high schools and our junior highs and with our sports programs. And honestly, these, these races could not happen without the volunteers. And for a bunch of high school students to show up at 5.30 a.m. to work on a Saturday morning, I, I just have to say kudos to you guys, all of you, and thank you for doing that. Um, I, I just also want to acknowledge that um, one of my, my colleague, Daniel Dodge Jr., and I, um, earlier this evening, we were a bit tardy because we were at an event tonight that we were requested to be at to honor one of our own former governing board members, a former teacher for our school district, a former PBFT president for our school district, who also served on numerous committees, um, adult ed, migrant ed, just to name a few, um, in the district. And up until her passing, just in August, um, she also served on numerous commissions with the city of Watsonville, um, was actually serving on the library commission up to her passing in August. So I just want to recognize and thank Rhea DeHart for her countless years of service to our community. Um, just last night, the city council uh, approved a proclamation unanimously, um, noting October 9th, Rhea DeHart's birthday. She would have been 97 today um, as Rhea DeHart Day in Watsonville. I would like to charge this governing board and our district's administration that we look to do something within our district, giving her countless years of service to this district specifically um, to recognize her, whether it be through adult ed, through migrant ed, through Watsonville High, and um, I would certainly appreciate being a part of that conversation to decide what that be and that we do something officially to honor and recognize her and her legacy that she left behind in this community, particularly mentoring so many young women in our community. So thank you. So Jennifer, Dr. <laughs> So it's been a busy few weeks. Um, I was able to go to the youth climate strike um, this in the city of Watsonville. I um, spoke to numerous students who participated in the strike, as well as some teachers who helped the students put on the strike. And I applaud their efforts that they made um, in trying to change the world that we live in. A lot of young people have a lot of good ideas, and I will continue corresponding um, with them. Also, school visits have started. Um, I always give teachers and students a little while to get used to the school year before I go out doing some site visits. So you will be seeing me around your school campuses soon, visiting the teachers, administrations, and students. Um, also, I've been talking to um, City of Watsonville. We've had uh, meetings with them about issues that pertain to both the city and to the school, um, we're taking on the vaping issue. Um, as you know, there was a presentation um, last board meeting about the vaping issue. So that is something that we take seriously, um, as well as educating the youth about um, vaping. So there's a, a lot of things to look forward to um, coming up. We also have the State of the District Breakfast on Friday that I will be going to, and so I hope to see some of you there also. Thank you. Good evening. So um, I also started my site visits as, as school is kind of settling in. Um, this week I did a site visit to Watsonville Prep to see how the school was developing their program. Um, I also attended our uh, community advisory committee for SELPA and we heard from the Special Parents Information Network from Easter Seals and the San Andreas Regional Center and they discussed many of the services that are available to our special needs families. And I encourage you know, community members to come to these meetings because they have, there's a wealth of information. Um, and even if you, know, you don't have a special needs child in your life currently, there are resources for supporting those members of our community that do. Um, I also had an opportunity to attend a school nurses meeting and as a nurse myself, it was really, um, special to see you know how our school nurses are supporting our kids you know in our schools and i'm starting to learn a little bit more about you know what they're dealing with so that's it for now 
Medea. Thank you, Karen. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us at tonight's meeting. I would like to start my comments by thanking the Watsonville City Council for unanimously passing a local ordinance banning the sale of flavored tobacco products and tobacco products from our local pharmacies. So con congratulations to PBPSA in a job well done and for the amazing work that you're doing around in partnership with our district around this issue. Um, we also had our Paro Valley Education Foundation meeting about two weeks ago and we're in the process of brainstorming for future uh, fundraisers in addition to the development and launching of our foundation's website. So stay tuned for more details. We're very excited about kicking off a strong year and um, we're looking forward to garnering additional community support and partnerships. Um, also, AB Assembly Bill 1505 was signed by our governor. Uh, this piece of legislation empowers communities to consider the fiscal impact of new charter schools and existing schools in the neighborhood, increases accountability and transparency for all charter schools, and ensures that high quality charter schools continue to thrive. It's a huge victory for public education. I wanna recognize our teachers who are here tonight and everyone who has uh, been part of those efforts in making sure that um, this piece of legislation was passed. I know there was a lot of advocacy um, uh, from uh, not only board members, uh, but also uh, the larger community uh, in getting this passed. I'm also looking forward to the State of the District breakfast on Friday and uh, the special needs conference that will be happening at Yale Hall. Thank you. Go ahead, if you wanna say something. Hi, um, I don't have anything for today, but I'm just very honored to be on this board, and um, I think that this is a really good opportunity for me, and I'm just very excited, so that's all. Thank that's you. <laughs> Thank you, Karen, and welcome to everybody. Um, really pleased to have you as a student representative. Um, I, I still get texts and phone calls from former student representatives who are now finished in their senior year in college and getting ready to apply to graduate schools. So um, we're very pleased and it is a great opportunity. It's gonna look great on your resume to apply to school. So thank you for volunteering and stepping up and I know it was sort of a rigorous process to get here, so congratulations. Um, in the past two weeks I've been to the um, Pajaro Valley Prevention Meeting. That's a standalone nonprofit dedicated to the mental health and wellness of um, students and families in our district. Tomorrow night, um, they're having um, an annual Soup for a Cause fundraiser, and I'm sorry if it's going to compete with the Pajaro Valley football jersey event, but um, there'll be a lot of guest servers, including uh, Dr. Rodriguez, former Congressman Sam Farr, and other dignitaries serving soup to uh, soup, fresh bread, and desserts um, to all of us. So I'll be there tomorrow night. And thank you all for being here. Oh, sorry, it's at the, the Civic Plaza Room. Is that at, yeah, it's a city, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fourth floor, thanks. Good evening, everybody. Glad everybody made it tonight, even though with all these blackouts that are affecting all of us somehow, some way, but um, thank you for coming. Um, I know we have a busy um, agenda, so I just want to real quickly echo what Trustee Acosta said. We should definitely follow what she proposed. Um, October 19th is a special needs conference in E Hall, as Trustee Roscoe said. Um, I also attended the climate strike a couple weeks ago with Trustee Shocker. Um, regardless of what some people may say, climate change is real, so we need to keep working on that. Um, Last Saturday, I attended the Queer Trans Allied Straight Conference at uh, Watsonville High School with uh, Mayor Paco Estrada and Ferris Sabah. Um, they gave me a couple uh, minutes to speak and I said that Pajaro Valley Unified School District is, will always be a safe, safe, safe space for everybody. And I also attended the Watsonville City Council meeting last night where they passed the ordinance to ban flavored tobacco in e-cigarettes and vaping machines, so thank you. Well, I didn't do as much last week, <laughs> but 
But um, I have quite a few meetings next week. I have the Adult Education Advisory Committee, the District English Language Advisory Committee, and the Migrant Head Start Advisory Committee. Plus, so I have lots of meetings next week. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that all of you as well are invited to our State of the District breakfast. That's this Friday, and it starts at 8 30. 8.30 this Friday, and we're going to have all a lot of fabulous speakers there, including the special one we had tonight. <laughs> it can be there too, again. Um, and um, it's going to be it's going to be very inspiring to hear what we've accomplished in the last year um, and what and where where we're going this year and in the future. So I hope you all, as many of you can come, should come. And that you all go to, <laughs> I don't know if you can go to both of the events, <laughs> the Carmona event <laughs> and the one on the fourth floor. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, thank you. Um, now we're going to have the, not as exciting, <laughs> the approval of the agenda. Oh, uh, where where are we? Where where are we? Uh, President oh. Trustee Osmondson, could you just restate where the State of the District breakfast is being held on Friday at eight thirty? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I do need to tell you that it's it's going to be where their event is going to be tomorrow. It's going to be at the on the fourth floor, in the community room, at the City Plaza, City Plaza fourth floor community room. That's where it's going to be. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. <laughs> so um, I have, um, we have usually have student representatives, and tonight we are going to have Pajaro Valley High School student representatives here to tell us what they're doing and what their plans are in the future. Pajaro Valley High School. Good evening, board members, fellow students, parents, and peers. My name is Andrew Lorente, the ASB Vice President. And I'm Adam Tingodin, the ASB President, and we are the student representatives of Parra Valley High School. For our activities, the most previous Spirit Week we had was the Pink Out Week, which lasted all of last week. It stood for breast cancer awareness and during lunch, we would sell cups that had a shirt, pom-poms, and bracelets that would be used for Pink Out games. Since we also sold food during lunch, students had the choice to use the Five Star app to purchase snow cones or, and con candy if they had 50 points or for a few bucks. Not the animal or things you read, but the actual money that would be used to support ASB for events. During the youth climate change strike at our school, we witnessed an, an outstanding group of students voicing their concerns about the environment. Some of our peers even marched to the plaza to show how serious we are about change. Last Tuesday, we attended a leadership conference, Castle Cafe, and Salinas with a bunch of other leadership students from various schools. The experience was extremely fun and even competitive. We Grizzlies had the chance to express our pride even with the risk of losing our voice since we would chant against other schools. Unfortunately, we initially sat next to the loudest group in the room and we were diminished. However, <laughs> we showed them what we really got when it came to dancing since we were the last group of people dancing on the dance floor. Even Ms. Brusso, our activities director who's pregnant, that's the Caballo Dorado and was one of the last ones remaining. Good job, Ms. Brusa. <laughs> Furthermore, to express our sp support for the breast cancer awareness this month, we amplified the importance of each sports game last week. There was a volleyball ping-out game, a tennis ping-out game, and a football ping-out game. Even though some of the teams, such as that of volleyball and football, were losing during their games, they maintained a positive spirit and behavior as they showed immense amount of grit until the end. These losses remain to be used as fuel to boost the morale of each team. However, our Ghost Tennis team has been doing amazing performances this year. Not only did they win in their pink out game, but they, they have been impressive overall. During each pink out game, it was also significant to have teachers recognized by the senior athletes of the, each team, showing how much they appreciated their chosen teachers. As a result, we were able to see extra joy in their faces through these specific um, athletic sports games of the pink out week, we know it was genuine spirit from every student, 
including the fact that several of them were able to clear a Saturday school for attending the games. And for academics, the Watsonville Ivy League program tour was a success as the entire trip immensely domestified the Ivy League universities for all the PV and Watsonville High students that attended. But one of the 14 students actually liked New York since the rest of us hated the unhealthy smells and I won't go too in depth with what they were. And only a few of the tours we had were insightful and intri intriguing because the others were mediocre or lacked the enthusiasm to sell the true remark of the school's significance. And for many of the schools, we were able to face a powerful first-hand experience when it came to speaking to people who shared similar backgrounds as us, especially when we went to certain Latinx community housing areas. And with the help of Mr. Jones from Watsonville High, a mock trial club is now established in both PVHS and Watsonville High, starting with 11 members at our site. Our senior class vice president, Anna Chow, took the initiative to recruit students who are interested in tackling interesting cases, which resulted to a great finish uh, a great finish of the first meeting yesterday. And for debates, they continue to be prominent for Pajaro Valley High School classes. Specifically with the juniors, the AP Spanish class has a debate project with topics provided by the teacher. And additionally, the classic Hamilton versus Jeff Jefferson debate of loose and strict interpretation of the Constitution occurred a few weeks ago for the AP US History class. Another highlight is a teacher for the school's AP English class who assigns a needed insane amount of essays to pass the class. And one of our buildings is actually named after him. His name is Jim, so the basketball and volleyball players get to have fun in his building um, much of the time. And then furthermore, college applications have started and it has caused growing stress that was already terrible from the start of many of our junior year AP classes. Some of the students have had workshops regarding FAFSA and various CSU and UC applications by the EAOP program and the Upward Bound program. Once again, thank you all for listening. It was fun to have an adrenaline rush up here again. And I hope you all have a good night. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> wow, you guys were great. <laughs> so now I'm starting over. <laughs> uh, the important part of the agenda. Um, so I'm going to do the approval of the agenda, kind of a motion. I'd like, I'd to, like to make a motion to approve the agenda, but with consideration of the audience we have, on, um, particularly on item 9.2, I'd like to move that up to before our action items, before starting items 8. I was also going to move, um, if I could, I could I'll, I'll second that, but I'd like to also move um, 8.1 up as well to before that I, or because it would be 9.2 and then 8.1 or you want 8.1 to go before 9.2 or did you want to move them up before public comment an employee organization yeah so do you want to move all of it up then those two items that move would be it all fine. up before public comment yeah do you think I, if I make I, I'm almost concerned that maybe we should hear public comment mm -hmm. and put it in between public sure. comment and employee sure. organizations I have something to say uh, mm -hmm. um, I just want to let the board know we have lots of public comment it is and that all I'm sure pertains to non agenda items correct yes so what are you requesting, Kim? Can you, would you use saying you would like to move it before public comment then? I would. Okay, so I'm gonna amend my motion that I will approve the agenda and that we move action item 8.1 and report and discussion item 9.2 to before public comment, which is 6.1. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, I'm going to do 5.1, which is a approval of September 25, September 25th board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Motion. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? There's going to be people that weren't there, right? So abstain. Abstain. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, now we're doing, is it 8.1 or 9.2? <laughs> I think 
Okay, so now we're going to do 8.1, which is approved resolution declaration of cooperative support and collaboration between Pottle Valley Unified School District and the Aptos Sports Foundation by Dr. Rodriguez, Michelle Rodriguez, superintendent. So as I'm speaking and talking about the declaration, I can, if I can ask um, the members of the Aptos Sports Foundation that are here, if they can come on up towards um, the podium, that would be great. Um, so as you all know, we had a presentation by the Aptos Sports Foundation previously, and one of the requests was that we reaffirm the commitment of collaboration that we have. Um, and so at that board meeting, they spoke to the great work um, that they've done and that they continue to do as they're moving um, forward um, for the community as a whole. Um, so this resolution, um, it just reaffirms that cooperation and, um, and our willingness to really um, be open-minded to think about um, possibilities of how we can get um, facilities um, for, for our students. Um, specifically, since it's Aptos Sports Foundation, they specifically um, support um, Bradley Elementary, Marvis Elementary, Rio del Mar, um, Valencia, Aptos Junior, and Aptos High. Um, and um, they're really working on fostering the well-being, health, community engagement, and other benefits that local athletic um, activities can do and support. Um, and. Um, if you'd like to stand Yeah, hi. I'm uh, John Marinovich. I'm a director on the Aptos Sports Foundation. Uh, first of all, I want to say, Stella, congratulations. Thank you. On your appointment. It's fantastic. So I'm uh, Paul Bailey, who's the founder of the foundation, cannot be here tonight. Uh, he's in Iowa, shucking corn. <laughs> he's actually at a, a real estate seminar. And I'm just going to give you a brief overview. I won't be long. Uh, the foundation was founded by Paul Bailey over 40 years ago. Uh, it's comprised of uh, alumni, community members. We are a nonprofit. Uh, over the years, we've raised $5 million plus, and that continues to grow uh, for Aptos High and other, the other mid county uh, entities. Uh, we are an independent organization. Uh, we're dedicated to improving the lives of students and uh, the facilities at these. Uh, places in mid-county. Uh, I'm the project coordinator basically for uh, the event, uh, the things that we do for facilities. Uh, in my private life, I'm self-employed in the athletic industry. I deal with districts and facilities all over the state of California. So I, and I also deal extensively with DSA, Division of State Architects. So I'm familiar with the, uh, the way things work. Uh, we've had a good relationship with the district uh, for many years. Uh, we've gotten a lot done, and uh, we want to continue in that uh, mode. Uh, we do want to maintain our independent standing with the, uh, the Aptos Sports Foundation, and we want to work with the district in tandem to improve the student experience, facilities, uh, and it's, it would be a mutually beneficial relationship, obviously. Uh, Joe, I can, we can help fund your projects. That's what we're here to do and uh, get things done for you, help facilitate. And uh, we really, really want to work with you. I know you have a, a, your plate is full. You have a ton of projects going on and we're here to help. Um, so we're grateful for the proclamation and uh, the continued support of the district and the trustees. And uh, we look forward to working with you. Uh, one thing I do want to mention real quick, we do have a 50th uh, Aptos High Anniversary Gala at the Seascape Resort. I brought a couple flyers that I'll uh, just leave here. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez, I know you can't attend. We've already no, talked about that. I'll be in Iowa. You, exactly. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I think it's San Diego, isn't it? Oh, yeah, because it's San Diego. <laughs> Right. Anyway, uh, so thanks again for your support, and uh, that's it. Thank you. No speakers on the foundation. Right? Yeah. So we're actually voting on this found wonderful foundation that we have for Aptos Mid County. <laughs> um, so 
um, President Osmondson. I'd, I'd like, if there are no um, further comments, I'd like to move that we approve this resolution and show second. our support for the Aptos Sports Foundation and all I that second. they've done. Thank you. Did I get a second? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jennifer, sure. Okay. So all those in favor? Wait, did you get a second? Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor again? Aye. 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 <laughs> all those opposed? Okay, Thank seven you. zero one. Thank you very much. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now we're going to do um, the nine point two one that was asked to move up to before the comments, um, and that is in regards to PVUSD special services mental health services. Presentation by Heather Gorman. She is the director of SELPA. Well, good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm happy to be here again tonight. Um, and I brought along Lauren Fine, and she can introduce herself. Hi, so my name is Lauren Fine. I'm a program manager at Children's Behavioral Health and been working with Heather and her wonderful team um, over in SELPA. So we've been working together for over four years now, and I need to find this remote to make sure I can do that. Um, and with County Behavioral Health to support our students with IEPs that have mental health needs. So I will go through this. So we had a question about four years ago now, or three and a half years ago, about where some funds were going that were restricted funds in our budget, and it came from the board. And so we were looking at how those funds were being spent, and it was basically the mental health funds. And so I put together a three-year plan, and this is the plan that I, um, the same one that I presented on twice now as moving forward. And so last year was the last year of that three-year plan and how we were spending that money. And as you can see, we're strengthening remaining missing components of our RISE Academy. We had um, worked with Diana Browning Wright to put that together, but then in collaboration with County Behavioral Health, we also provide mental health services to all of our students that qualify for those services. And um, that's basically where we've been working since that and, and looking at how we are using those funds. So our main goal is to address the needs of the whole child to ensure they are college and career ready by increasing resiliency, well-being, and the ability to cope with life stressors both in school and at home. So our target population, more than 20% of children and adolescents have mental health problems. Schools must address these issues in order to graduate students that are contributing adults. School-based mental health services are evolving as a strategy to address the needs of students by removing barriers to accessing mental health services. We're providing, we're, we are provided restricted funds to support students with mental health needs. PVUSD target population are students K through 12 with IEPs and identified mental health issues. PVUSD has implemented a three-prong approach to increase support. And this also goes back to what I mentioned in our three-year plan. It's the same thing. I've made it look a little bit different in some of these slides. So really, we're looking at parents and families, students, and staff, and our behaviorists. So when we work with County Behavioral Health and our own mental health clinicians, they don't just serve our students. They serve our parents and families also in supporting them. They work in the classroom, and they support staff in the classroom, and they work in groups. And then they also work individually with students. So these, the students that are receiving this type of support are our highest need students for mental health. Um, just in our high school area, we at Watsonville High, PV High, Aptos High, and other, we have our RISE Academy students and how many students are receiving services. And then in the orange, you're seeing the outpatient services. So these outpatient services are still um, given to students that have IEPs, and there's still a high need. They have to have an emotional disturbance. 
and then they receive services too. And Lauren has a little bit more information about K-12, which we didn't get on here, so you can talk to that. Yeah, so basically the clinicians from Children's Behavioral Health provide the educationally related mental health services between kindergarten and eighth grade. And I have um, a little. What I'm passing around is our equivalent to this graph. And basically, um, from K through eight, we serve 23 kids in the middle school. And that's a combination of both the RISE and outpatient. And then we serve 28 in elementary. Um, and the major difference between RISE and outpatient, just to clarify, is that um, the RISE clinicians are in the RISE Academy classroom and really part of the therapeutic environment whereas our outpatient kiddos are being served at school, usually pulled out of the classroom. But in both situations, we work with families um, in the home, in the community, in our offices, whatever makes sense for that family. We also have access to psychiatric services, if that's appropriate, and really just have a whatever it takes attitude to wrap each kid with whatever services they need so they can access their education. So moving forward, so we put together a three-year plan that has come through, but now we're looking at how do we move our programs forward. So comprehensive school mental health systems provide an array of support, and we're working with a variety of people for our next steps and how we're going to support and look at it. So creating a comprehensive school mental health system, working with PVPSA, our nurses, county behavioral health, student services, social emotional counselors, and school psychologists, just to name a few of the groups that I think we need to really get together to start this process of how do we build tiers of supports for our students that start with students that have a less need and then all the way up to students that qualify for men, um, educationally related mental health services. So we really kind of, as I was saying, we really want to promote a positive social, emotional, and behavioral skills and overall wellness for all students at the base. That's where we want everybody to be. And then supporting an early intervention for students identified through a needs assessment as being at risk for mental health concerns, and then targeted intervention for students with serious concerns that impact daily functioning. So looking again is where are we at in all of these areas and how are we supporting our students throughout our school districts. A couple of things that we're doing this year to move our program forward is that we're teaming with, um, it's called teams, and they're really looking to support our clinicians and how to help students with um, Asperger's, or not Asperger's, ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, and how do you work with students that have two different disabilities but need the support because it's not always the same and sometimes it can be challenging. So we've, we've worked with te teams that's looking at a better way to support therapists in helping children with ASD. And then AIM High is an intervention to reduce challenging behaviors in children with autism spectrum disorders ages 5 through 13 within mental health services. And this study may help us understand how to best help therapists work with children with ASD. So we have a group of therapists right now that are identified that are getting this support and training so that they can work with students with ASD. And another thing that we are looking at and working with is a, um, it's a curriculum to help support students that have school phobia um, and school refusal, they're not coming to school. So we have, we went to um, a conference and they presented on this and we brought it here to our school district. So we're teaming with different people. So we have a team of three school psychologists, mental health clinicians, alternative education teacher to team with student services um, on an eight week parenting class based on a cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy, CBT approach using a guided curriculum that came recommended by a district who presented on it last year at Every Child Counts conference. And so I, um, the name of that curriculum, and I'm sorry I didn't put it up here, was When Children Refuse School, and it's, like I said, a cognitive behavioral approach. So it's looking at how are we working not just with the children but with the families to support them to get their children to school. So those are some of the new things that we're doing this year. 
And I think that's it. Thank you. Is there any comments from the board? There's no speakers, right? Oh, there's your one. One speaker. 9.2, we have Anilu Betancourt. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I am here because of a recent incident at my son's school. But before I get to that, I would like to give you a little background on his education history. Aiden has been at a Messi since kinder. His previous teacher, Ms. Munoz, and her team worked with Aiden for four years. The first two years were the hardest since Aiden was young and lacked the coping skills he needed to deal with frustration and anger. So he often became angry and aggressive towards his teachers. However, Ms. Munoz and her team worked hard developing a relationship with Aiden and creating a safe place within the classroom for him. When Aiden became aggressive with them and they had to use a restraint to keep him and everyone safe, no bruises were left on his body. If anything, Aiden would leave bite marks and bruises on them. I never felt my child was being mistreated. During this time with Ms. Munoz, Aiden made a significant amount of progress both emotionally and academically. Just last year, Ms. Munoz, his county, county mental health counselor, and I had conversations about the possibility of moving him out of the ed class. Based on his progress this last year, his counseling services were adjusted so that he was not receiving them as often as before as Aiden had developed coping skills and was using them appropriately. Aiden went over a year without having incidents at school that required any type of hold. He consistently earned his reward time at school every day based on his good behavior at school. My child would beg to go to school because for him, this was a safe place. He knew his teachers cared about him and he enjoyed being there. At the end of the school year, Aiden found out Ms. Munoz and everyone in the classroom was not going to be at a messy this year. I still under, understand how an entire team that was so successful with my child moved out of a messy. And the class is still there with new staff. I understand that kids need to be able to adjust to change, but for students such as my child who have a difficult time with change, this has created a situation where he has regressed behaviorally and emotionally. Which brings me to the reason why I'm here talking to you. On September 16th, my son was sent out of a classroom for a timeout. He was left unsupervised even though my child tends to elope when he is agitated. When Aiden was hiding from staff at school, he was hiding from staff at school, but once the behavioralist realized he was missing, she went to look at the cameras and located him. When she tried to approach him, Aiden began to walk away from her. This is probably due to the fact that she has not developed a relationship with my child. And so, in, and she, and so instead of listening to her, she made his way to the street. I understand that leaving campus is a safe concern, especially because it is a busy street. But what I'm trying to understand is why the behaviorist, the one who is dealing with the situation and not the teacher or the staff in the classroom. Ms. Bancourt, that was two minutes. So you just had two minutes. So if you just wanted to. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Teachers, staff in the classroom are the ones who are supposed to have a relationship with him. The way I see it, the behavior is, my child is the point where he felt he needed to leave campus. But the biggest concern is that my child was left with big bruises next to his wrist by his joint. I am not a trained person in restraining, 
but it is very clear to me that holding a child near a joint when they are trying to escape is not the best idea as it could really hurt them. I am also concerned at the amount of force he would was used to restrain my child, leaving such big bruises. And when I met with SELPA administration to create a plan for Aiden, I brought up the bruises that were left on my child. And the answer I got from them, in certain cases, it happens, and she says she was sorry. Well, sorry is not good enough for me. And this is why I reached out to Dr. Rodriguez. As a parent, I am extremely concerned with what is going on in my child's class. How could he have been having an extreme successful year from being held 5150 twice since Ms. Munoz left a Mastie. Having since how much progress he has made in the, in the last couple of years, I am extremely concerned of his reaggression. Re I am looking for answers and a plan to help my child receive the education that he is entitled in a safe and healthy environment. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Mm -hmm. Hi, Heather. I have some questions for you. Um, so thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, what I, I'm not sure I saw in your presentation was any data about outcomes or numbers, how many I mean, I think there was a little bit of that, but. Right, right. So do we have any findings yet, even if they're preliminary, about whether or not these, the money being spent is actually impacting so we kids' do have, time in school or their right. progress we do, and success? We do have some findings for students that have graduated from our RISE Academy program. So Can you do me one favor? Mm -hmm. um, just for the public who doesn't know what the RISE Academy is, do you mind just like yeah. two sentences about sure. what it is and sure. what the purpose? Yeah, yeah. so um, we, we did, we met and we built a program to really support our students with emotional disturbances within the district. So our classrooms that support our students are named the RISE Academy program. Um, this was something that students actually helped us build the name and came up with, um, made a logo for it. But really the focus is on uh, an evidence-based program to, for, to support students with emotional disturbances. So um, within that program and um, just from last year looking at our data that we had four students graduate from our middle school program. Um, the year before that, we only had two, so if you're looking at the fact that we're doubling our numbers in students that are going through the program and actually graduating out into general education classes or a less restrictive um, environment, because at times, too, they may still need support with academics in RSP or mild moderate um, program. Um, so. We're seeing this in middle school because I think some of the things that we have come across in our elementary schools are starting to help us progress and students are actually being able to follow through and graduate once they get to the middle school program. So has this particular program and the other services that you detail mm -hmm. um, prevented any students from being um, leaving the district on their own accord or being um, expelled or for behavior issues? Yeah, I, I can and what I can come back with is just some information for you because what we were looking at is really how many behavior incidents we have, which they have decreased and I have, I can gather those numbers for you but I don't have them off the top of my head. But we do have a decreased number of incidences where students have had severe behaviors. And um, I'm sorry if I missed this in the presentation. Is the rights program at, is there a classroom in every school or just select schools? There are just select schools. We have two classes at a Mesty Elementary School. We have two classes at Rolling Hills Middle School. And we have two classes at Watsonville High School. That helps me understand the mental health chart because I was unsure about why we had such a spike at a Mesty and Rolling Hills. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because yeah. those are, that's where so, our So I'm sorry, are. a Mesty, Rolling Hills, and what's the third? And Watsonville High School. Thank you. So we have K through 12. 
support. And so do kids from other um, schools that need these services then they're bused to these we do, locations? Or? We do have other students from um, a different school district that are bused that come in that's out of our district. And then if they're within our district, they are bused um, within. And how many, um, how many children do you like to, or students do you target per classroom? Like what's the maximum? Well, it's, we do really try to keep our classrooms small. And so you wouldn't want more than 10 students in a classroom, but we do have less than that um, most of the time with our classrooms because you want to have that ratio of probably two students to one adult if that, I mean, when needed. And sometimes you need one to one support. Sometimes you can work in small groups, and sometimes you can actually work in larger groups with the whole class. And then we're also working on students graduating up and mainstreaming out to general education classrooms. And so that's a big focus in the elementary. And do we have one psychologist dedicated to this entire program, or is it multiple? It's multiple psych psychologists, yes. Any so social workers yet in the programs? No social workers, yes. <laughs> That's what Kim is. <laughs> that would be my goal. <laughs> that would be Kim. <laughs> um, and if you had a magic wand and needed more resources to support this program, what would you need? Oh, I have people here. What would we? <laughs> um, I, I actually do think um, more behaviorist support. Behaviorist would be, support. Yeah. Okay. If I had a magic wand. Thank you. And, yeah, and we feel like we are well staffed with county behavioral health and mental health yeah. services. I know Can't at the high school level, you know, the, the numbers have grown this year. So that, that means um, there are more students that are qualifying. So oh. the high school does tend to, because we have group homes in our area, so they can get an influx and then people, the kids, the students will move away. So um, then you need more support behaviorally and with mental health services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for um, your presentation. Um, Ms. Gorman, I haven't been here this long. Mm -hmm. um, I've only been here for almost a year. And um, we've done many presentations on self, but um, I've attended schools that aren't within my district, but you know the other trustees um, share knowledge and information. And I don't understand how we get these presentations and it looks like we're doing well but when I'm in the community with the teachers and the parents and some of the workers um, my question is you know, are these parents wrong are these teachers wrong about these concerns that we hear every so often you know I don't mean to put you on the spot but you know I, I'm here to ask the questions where the community and the teachers and the students mm -hmm. aren't, you know, they're afraid, as we heard many, many times before. And are they wrong when they speak about these issues? I, I, I would never stand up here and say parents are wrong. I think there are lots of things to look at. And if something happened to somebody in an instance, there is, there is what happened and how the parent feels and how the child feels. And that is very, that's, that's how it is for them. That's their feeling and what they want to say about it. There is also what happens in the classroom with the teacher and the back history. And so there's always a lot more when you're talking about what is happening and how people are thinking and feeling about things. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we are presenting what we're seeing in a lot of instances. But I'm not saying in any way that special services is running smoothly. We have a task force. We're working on issues. And I want to listen and hear issues. So it's good for me to be here and listen to what's going on and what people come up here to say, because it doesn't fall on deaf ears. It's not that I'm sitting here thinking, oh, you know, I want to hear it and I want to try to help and improve it. Mm -hmm. And so things that I'm doing and talking about are the things that I'm putting into place or we're as a team putting into place to help support and programs that we're finding that are evidence-based and ways that we can help support and move forward. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of change and growing when things like that happen and sometimes it's difficult, but it's because we're hearing issues that we're bringing things forward and we're doing this. 
Thank you. And um, just one more thing. Um, I've been researching this a lot. I know a lot of us have. And uh, I know we have an organizational chart on the PVUSD website. Mm -hmm. But I've looked into what San Diego Unified School District, and I looked at their organizational chart, and I wanted to see if we could kind of match the structure of theirs. I wanted to see if that's possible. That way we could, because I know ours is kind of like side to side, and so it's kind of complicated. So I, w I was at in Sacramento, and I talked to the director of San Diego because we were all at a meeting together. And you know, there it is very different because we're a single SELPA, and there are multi-district SELPAs. And so we can look at how we can match this, but there is there are those differences that you know single SELPA districts have d a different makeup because we are our own SELPA. We take on all but of our students. I, I understand that, but they have a hundred thousand students, and we have twenty thousand, and. Mm -hmm. I think that's simple for us to kind of look and understand. I know it's different, but I'm just trying to find ways where we could look at things and try to see where, you know, we need more people in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know we talked about this, and I just want to be able to talk back to my community and be able to point things out. And um, I think ours is kind of complicated, so if we can look at ways to make it more simpler. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I know that SELPA has been a, a topic of discussion a lot lately, but we also know that it's an area that has been overlooked and um, needs a lot of support. I do appreciate your presentations, but I would like more of a true presentation that goes over SELPA's challenges and needs. Um, my colleague, Ms. DeSerpa, gave a perfect opportunity for you when she asked if you had a magic wand what would you do? And you kind of a little bit floundered a little bit with that, was saying, I would need, like more behaviorist. I know that we need a lot more than just behaviorist. Um, so Sorry, I Sorry, and I was thinking specifically just for this okay. program, not overall, because there's a lot, yeah. Yeah, so I would just, in the future, just try and um, also be a little bit more honest with yourself and the board about what really needs that you have, what are your true needs that you're having, what are your true challenges you're having, because we're here to support you Thank and you. help you, and we can't make changes without people coming to us and telling us what they truly need. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just for, you know, all of us, you know, we've talked about, you know, having continued, you know, presentations and discussions about this, and this clearly is a key issue for, you know, all aspects of our community, for, you know, superintendent, for Heather, for, you know, our parents, for our teachers, and I, I hope that we continue to have these discussions so that we can collaboratively work together to, towards solutions that help our, our kids. I just have one comment. Um, I know that we're going to be bringing um, special ed um, as a study session, I believe, in December. So I think that would be the perfect opportunity for you to bring all that data that we're looking okay. forward, right? Um, as we invest in new programs and proven initiatives, we also want to see what those results are looking like. Mm -hmm. how, many, how many special ed students are actually uh, being able to transition into a mainstream environment, right? Are it, the initiatives being effective? Um, how can we uh, get more parent involvement around their child's needs? Um, so I'm looking forward to that presentation in the hope that we have that data, but also a plan moving forward for the department, right? Um, not only addressing the needs of the child, but also the structural issues within the department. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I think when you came in, it was a mess. <laughs> so I recognize that you've done a tremendous amount of work and improvements. Um, but like anything else, you know, like everything else, when we're trying to change uh, a department that has been not working as, as well as we expected it to, mm -hmm. it takes time. So I also want to recognize, you know, you, your efforts and um, and to the larger community. It's like we're listening. We're having those discussions with you. We're listening. We're making note of things that you want to see changed. Um, 
and, and hopefully that information is being given to you, Heather, so that as you and your team work together on that task force, we're able to really build a strong foundation moving forward for this department and really, uh, really with a focus on the well-being of every child um, and also the parent component. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for this yeah, presentation and hopefully uh, in December uh, we'll get the information that we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Um, can you bring back up the slide that you had with the RISE program and our three contemporary high schools? The that one? Yep. Yeah. So can you identify what other is for so, us? Lauren, do you want to speak to that? Um, sure. So other could be possibly Pacific Coast Charter, it could be the bridge, it could be home and hospital. These are kids that are not necessarily at one of those three comprehensive high schools that are still getting mental health services so that we could bridge them back to a school. It also could be kids that are going to an alt ed school uh, through County Office of Ed that are in this district. So it could be Sequoia, Ren or Renaissance is in your district, but schools like that. So it's not one of the three comprehensive schools. But definitely all ninth through 12th grade. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Okay, exclusively. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, so Heather, and I'm going to address this. I'm not going to just put you on this. I, I'm going to also address it to the superintendent, Dr. Regas, because really, she's the only one we can charge with a duty. Um, I'm concerned that when I see this, that from this one parent that came tonight to speak, that a behaviorist was not capable, able, or what how to de-escalate a situation with a vulnerable student, a special needs child, without it getting to the point of physically harming the child. That is extremely concerning to me, and it certainly should be to the, my other six colleagues. Um, I hear what you're saying about the December special study session, and also, you know, Trustee Osmondson and, and um, Trustee Dodge Jr., I, I heard your comments and we've heard this about wanting this to come back and come back, but here's one thing we don't get back in life. We don't get time back. That is the one thing in life we do not get back. Mm -hmm. I can work and I can make more money, I can earn more money, but we don't get time back. These students, their families, our teachers, they don't get time back. So whatever harm and damage happens in the interim, that's not repairable. That's not recoverable. So, you know, we have a superintendent who was brought on in this district in the school year of 2016-17. We're now at 2019-20. And now we're just saying, okay, well, come December, we'll have a special study session. And we're doing these things, and I understand the efforts, but it's not, I think, enough. So I think that the charge here needs to be to the superintendent with you from her direction. It's, it's got to be more of a, I mean, we're just reacting. A and at times, I don't even know that we're reacting to this. So we need to do something to be proactive and not constantly on the reactive side. That just doesn't make any logical sense to me. So I think that the charge that needs to come to the superintendent is before coming to this December meeting that there's more done on a proactive level to start addressing this, and it's not enough to just say, you got dumped a bad department. I get it. And, and you know, and this, she inherited this. But, you know, here we are four years later, and something needs to be done. And just to say, well, we're going to have a special study session, and we're going to sit around and discuss it in December is not enough. What are we doing on a proactive level to start addressing these issues? We've heard them time and time again. I mean, two board meetings ago, we spent an over an hour and a half on a presentation that was supposed to be not even 30 minutes. And I'm not, but I'm saying that's the charge that's coming from the community to us and in, in your department. So it's, it's risen to this level, so it needs to be addressed, is what I'm saying. Thank you, and that was a 15 minute discussion. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I just want to say, I mean, obviously a lot of the issues with mental health is because there's not enough money coming in from the state for your, or any mental health, any SELPA department in the state. Um, so that's a big issue, obviously. 
Um, and, um, you know, I've been here for a long time on the board, and I know how it was before you were here, and I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> um, I'm also really hopeful that the task force that's, I'm really hopeful for the task force, <laughs> I will say, and um, that the task force will be something that can do all the things she's, Georgia just talked about. She, they, you know, they can be there to, you know, provide, well, even provide more data about things to be able to provide more ideas and ways to solve things and, you know, whatever. I mean, all the stuff that I'm ho really hoping that this task force can make a big difference. <laughs> and it and it is, and it is meeting how often? Once a month. And Once we, a month. We already had our first meeting, and it was very successful, and I think very solution oriented. Yeah, that's what I'm good. thinking. Just it should be solution orient oriented. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, so so I'm I'm really hopeful for the task force to make a big difference. Heather, uh, just so for the larger public, can you just elaborate on what the task force, like the mission behind the task force are, what areas you will be focusing on? Because I think that addresses many of our concerns, including uh, uh, what Trustee Georgia uh, brought up. So it's, it's a group, and Casey Clattenbach and I are you know, running this, and we had our first meeting. It's um, made up of administration, um, general education, special education teachers. Um, we have speech and language pathologists. So there's a wide range of people that are involved with the task force. So it's not just a very close knit group. And so we are taking our um, direction at this point, really looking at um, information that has come to us from PVFT and issues that have come to them. So we started with looking at that. We've looked at our, um, our within things that have come to me just from different teachers and looking at how we're supporting that. So we're gathering information from the community and then we're also looking at you know what's coming from the state and where we need to improve in that area too. And so we're taking those issues and we have to take them one at a time of course and problem solving and looking at coming up with solutions. Did I miss one? No. Do you want to say anything, Casey? Sure. I just wanted to say that we're also working on building that community with multiple perspectives and bringing in um, an array of experts that are out there in the classrooms and the fields. Um, from the general education, special education, and building that community so we can actually pr um, problem solve together and learn how to respect different ideas and bring them in a safe place so we can actually um, support and, make in, and take solutions back to the classrooms. Can I just add one comment, Casey? I'm, I'm, I think I'm concerned that really at this point with how long of a trauma this issue has been, and how much there is to go in and try to repair and fix and also to strategize for going forward. Meeting once a month, I don't know if that like really cuts it with this. I mean, this almost seems like this needs to be something that's maybe met at a minimum bi-monthly, twice a month. I mean, because you're, you're dealing with recovery and repair and strategic planning going forward. You, you got these two huge components. I just don't... I mean, I, I couldn't imagine, right? If we met once a month to handle all the district's board meeting, our board, I mean, all the district's business, it, it wouldn't work, right? And, and we're mostly dealing with the now and going forward. So I, I would really suggest to you both and, and the superintendent that maybe to reevaluate that, that it should be meeting, especially right now, and if you're going into a big strategy meeting for December, then you're talking, Twice. you're get, gonna have two more meetings? I, I don't think it's enough. I think you really should look at that. But you work at the direction of the superintendent, so take what she tells you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we can look at that. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so N now we're in the area of um, visitor non-agenda items, so we have quite a few yes. ready right. to talk tonight. So 
Danny is going to be calling you by threes, at yes. least by threes. And so all three of you need to be ready to get up or, or already up, ready to go to the microphone so we can move along and get, you know, get our two minutes in there and speak to what we have, whatever we need to speak about. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. We got Stacy Dietrich, Marcy Mock, and Laura Zucker. The first three. Hello, uh, my name is Stacy Dietrich. I'm a speech language pathologist with the district. I've been here about 10 years. Oh, good. And I just wanted to share a story about one of my students. Um, he is a nonverbal child and he just wants to use his speech generating device to be able to talk. This is what his parents want and just want him to be successful. His original IEP team worked to get him a speech generating device in 2015. He obtained the device through Medi-Cal, so the student now owns it. Um, he was successful using the device to communicate his wants and needs with the device through the 2017-18 year. And when I spoke to his previous SLP to get his history, once I acquired this student, um, she said he was the best student, one of the best students he had working the device. In June 2018, the speech pathologist at the time was given a document to sign stating that she would not be allowed to work on the device, that only the augmentative and alternative communication specialist or the AECC specialist within our district would be the only one allowed to touch the device. Um, this is the SLP at the time argued against that because she was not able to add vocabulary and things as the student needs it. Um, the following year, he had a new SLP. At that time, the SLP did not want to get involved with the politics of the device, so he stopped using the device with the student. Um, this year, the student is with me at Ohlone. Um When I found out he had a device, I was thrilled. I wanted to use it. Um, I talked to the parent. The mom was on board. He's got a good home health team that really want to use it. So I talked to... Um, the AAC specialist again about getting training for all of us involved. Um, they said that we should attend one of the two trainings put on by Prenti Romatch. Um, I was able to attend the training, but the parent and the home aides were not able to attend. And then the teacher later received an email stating that no other trainings would be given. So the parents didn't get trained. Um, I'm going to give her my time. <laughs> Um, so I have now approached the AAC specialist again asking for to have him put on their caseload as well to help him with the device. The response I got from the, the specialist yeah. was that he should never have received the device. He was not a good candidate, which we have proven that he was able to use the device in the past. Um, as it stands now, the student is not receiving support from the specialist. So Myself and the teacher, Ms. Mock, um, are doing our best to support the student, but I am not trained on how to program it, so the student is left with the vocabulary that's on the device currently. Um, so I would like to finish making two things clear. Um, number one, the research now supports that the candidacy model, which the, SL, the, the uh, specialist is quoting, is no longer a valid participation. It's now a participation model is what's being um, promoted through ASHA, which is our state or our, no, our national board, um, and that the student should not be denied service because he was not a good candidate. And number two, um, it is not legal for one member of an IEP team to make a decision that involves the student. It should be a team decision. And in this case, it's going against the parent's wishes, and it's very concerning to me. Thank you. Wow. Next, we have Laura Zucker. Hi. Hello, Laura Zucker, uh, also a speech language pathologist. This is a, a speech generating device. I really wanted to know I was going to be working with kids with autism and other kids, and I bought one myself. It matches my glasses um, because I wanted to be able to learn the language because you all know I like languages, and I thought this is how I can be the best teacher. Um, also, because I was having a hard time even getting a device to show to children, which Again, is it not what we do anymore? We don't keep children from seeing a device until they've met certain prerequisites. And I have 
what she was talking about. That's called the candidacy model, which was uh, changed in the um, ASHA, our organization, our professional organization, uh, said we don't do the candidacy model anymore. That's from the 70s and the 80s. Um, we officially changed that um, and said that we were going to be doing the participation model in 2004. I did, that's a long document, our professional organization document, so I just have two things I put in the back which talk about the myths about um, augmentative, and um, augmentative and alternative communication and say that no, we now believe in the participation model. Give them the device and teach it to them as opposed to making them jump through hoops to prove that they can use one. Okay, so um, briefly, um, let's clarify some other issues. Um, by the way, an SGD, so that you know, the speech generating device, is acquired from Medi-Cal by a team, not by an individual as the, apparently the AAC specialist said that it had been acquired by the previous SLP, and that's not true. It's acquired by the team, the teacher, the OT, the child's doctor, and the parent um, write the request. Now, the only person who actually signs a speech generation, a SGD funding request or a talker funding request is actually the speech language pathologist, right? So what is the AAC specialist then? The AAC specialist is a speech language pathologist. All speech language pathologists have this and other yeah, and signing and other methods of alternative communication within our scope of practice. Um, AAC specialist is not a separate degree, it's not a separate credential. And so what we had actually argued against when we this, they decided to make a specialist position, we said, well, you know, that could be helpful, but we could also just just all learn more, and then we all know more. A lot of us already do know, are, are already specialists in this, but they made this position, and unfortunately they came up with the idea, or what we're seeing is there's this idea where they're the only person. This is a document that is written, that I received, that said only the so-called, so-named speech, I mean, speech generating device specialist will have anything to do with these. And that's simply not what we know. That's not what best past practice says. I, uh, sorry, always a team decision. So that's all I have to say. Yeah, but so yeah, um, Casey Cabin Black has been very good about saying let's have professional, a community will have professional discussions, right? We get to disagree and not be afraid of retaliation. So I say pick these up, read them, interesting reading about children's rights to have a talker. It's, and we should be able to say these things Say we disagree with a so named specialist who is our supposedly our peer without fear of getting in trouble in order to support children's rights. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Mrs. Zucker, did you have something to pass out to the board? I just had these things in the back, but I thought also the audience might like them. So, um, the next three speakers we have are Andy Valle. George Chen Valle and John Sims. Good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Andy Valle, and I am a RISE teacher at Amesti Elementary. I'm in my third year of being a RISE teacher in this district. Prior to teaching in the program, I was a BT in the PVUSD district, working in the ED program before it became RISE. As someone who has worked for the better part of a decade with the ED population, I can easily say that we've come such a long way. In addition to working with students with emotional disturbances, I am the parent of a child who has emotional disturbances. I think that this affords me the unique perspective of understanding this population and their families from multiple angles. Sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> You're doing great. I have dedicated my life to better understanding where these kids come from, the trauma that they endure, and the way that it impacts their families, as well as how it plays out in the classroom setting. I know the perception of these at-risk kiddos from multiple points of view, and I am not without some awareness as to the beliefs that many hold about their futures and the program that I run itself. Working as an aide, I saw many of my students come in and out of the elementary level, and we rarely saw successful graduation from a student in the program. Knowing that I had a responsibility to my child and the students that I serve, I did my very best that I can with them and decided to become a special education teacher and work with the students that hold such a very special place in my heart. When I was hired to be an ED teacher with PVUSD, I was told that I'd be implementing a new evidence-based program called RISE. This was unfamiliar to me because as I was an aide in the program, that was not adopted by the school district at the time. 
but I know that I was hired for a specific job, so I was flexible and worked very closely with the behaviorists and program specialists to make it the best that it could be. This is not to say that it wasn't without its challenges. As with any new program, things got worse before they got better. We worked on how to roll out a new program to Fidelity when the old one was operated for so long in isolation. Questions arose such as how do we fit in with inclusion and the rest of the school? How do we keep students safe and how do we align the site expectations and PBIS to our own rules? But with significant support and fortitude, we figured it out and little by little, one obstacle at a time. We found a place in special education and even better, we found one at a place in our school. In the past two years I have been teaching RISE, we have graduated more students from the RISE program than I saw in the nearly 10 years I worked as an aide. Um, I know my time is very, very short, so I will just skip ahead, sorry. I work with a difficult group of kids who are incredibly misunderstood. I work in a new program in which many do not understand and the information surrounding it is more recognized for the negative rather than the positive. I work with the kids and their families that often have significant trauma this work is hard and challenging, and I would not change it for the world. I am privileged to say that my son is success X, and that's because I fought for him. And as a teacher, I'm going to fight for these students as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jorge. I work at Salud para la Gente. I'm a community health outreach worker. Um, Salud para la Gente, for, um, for those of you who don't know, it's a community health clinic here in Watsonville. Uh, we serve about 27,000 patients. Uh, we offer medical, vision, dental, behavioral health, all in one place. Um, and we, I'm here because we were invited to talk on the issue uh, of chromium and water. Um, so we just want to say that Salud um, wants to advocate for patients in the community to have healthy water. Um, and we want to uh, work with whoever's working on this uh, to know the best strategies uh, that Salud can take to educate the community. Um, we're also here to help and support um, if there's any way we can help with advocacy um, it, or support policy making. Um, our stance is basically um, clean water for the community. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is John Sims. I'm a parent uh, with two students in PVOSD schools. I work as a math teacher at Aptos Junior High School and I live in the community. Um, I'm here tonight to speak to you about a key piece of communication between parents, staff, and students, and that's websites. Have you ever noticed that some websites like the DMV, the Treasury, or the Santa Cruz Jurors Commission are slow, outdated, and difficult to use? Now compare those experiences with those from Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and some of the other big tech companies. It's like night and day. Those firms have developed sites that make complicated tasks easy to use and quick to do. At one time, PVOSD had contracted with a site for students, families, and teachers that was easy to use. School Loop made it easy to understand really complicated things like grades, due dates, and assignments. However, since Synergy has been adopted, our website now embodies the qualities associated with some of those others. As a parent, the grade printouts from Synergy are very difficult to understand. Uh, before the meeting began, I left my son's social studies grade printout for you to look at. I challenge each of you to manually calculate the percentage that is shown at the top. It's very difficult to do and will take college level um, linear algebra because the grade printout omits important information that would be required to calculate at the level of a junior high school student. As a math teacher, I think about the minutes I lose each day waiting for different screens in Synergy to load. Synergy routinely takes over a minute for different, uh, to save students' work. And frustrating random errors can cause me to start over at any time. As a community member, I appreciate PVOSD's history of holding vendors and contractors accountable for services rendered. The error screens I mentioned earlier have been described to me as a known bug. Yet over a month into school, I continue to see these same screens each and every day. It appears to me that we've paid for software with bugs that's not being quickly corrected by the vendor. I'd like to suggest that PVUSD should give the best tools to students, teachers, and families, and we may not have done that. Uh, we walked away from a fast, efficient, easy to understand website provided by School Loop, and as a result, we're now responsible for another frustrating, difficult to use website. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers we have are Myra Hernandez, Woody Raharik, and George Feldman. 
Hello, my name is Maida Hernandez, and I am a community organizer with Community Water Center. Hello to some of the faces that I already know. So um, just a little background. Before I was an organizer, I was actually an academic advisor at Watsonville High uh, with the EAOP program that the students mentioned earlier. So I have some experience working with students um, at the high school level. Um, and he, with me here today are my colleagues Cesar and Natalie. And Cesar will be passing out some FAQs about the uh, situation that I will not be talking uh, about today, but rather the goal is to let you all know who we are and um, the work that we do. So as some of you may know, we have been meeting with uh, staff, uh, parents, teachers, um, district staff about Chromium 6 at Ohlone Elementary and Renaissance High. And so um, we are here to let you all know that we are here as a resource and we are here to partner with you to better um, this situation. So Community Water Center acts as a catalyst for community-driven water solutions and we do that with um, organizing, education, and advocacy. So we've been working with communities for over 14 years now in the Central Valley and we focus on drinking water issues, specifically those um, that uh, pose a health risk to people. And now, I forgot that I had a presentation, so if that can be up there, please. I thought it was Krishna. I had it all <laughs> that, that is mine, actually. That is for Krishna. Okay. Oh, that is? There's another one? Yeah, we have. It's kind of There are two, but I yeah. didn't have a name for this one. PWC? Yes. Yes. Got it. All right. Give me a second. It's coming. Go. All right. So you can see there our mission. And so, um, we already talked about that. And so there are a lot of resources available for water needs in California. And PVOSD is eligible to obtain those resources now. And so we believe that the district can start working on solutions for both schools um, now. And like I said, we are here as a resource and to partner with you all to uh, better the situation. Now, CWC. Um, opened its Central Coast office about a year ago now, and we have been helping uh, community members. We help them obtain a, a free bottled water delivery service that goes to their home due to high levels of contamination that is found in their water in their community. And so with that, we have worked with other school districts like uh, the Arvin Unified School District who had arsenic in their water. And so we help them uh, connect to other resources uh, we help them with education materials, fact sheets about the contaminants, and so we are very knowledgeable on these water issues. And we want to partner with PVUSD to help you like we helped Arvin uh, obtain safe water for the schools, for the students, for the teachers and the staff, everyone that is uh, potentially at risk at the schools. And so, like I said, we're here to be a partner and we hope that we can better the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for, for having me. My name is Woody Rehanek. Actually, I'm a retired special education teacher with the district. I taught for 18 years and retired two years ago. And then I joined an organization called Safe Ag, Safe Schools. My one 25 words or less advice to reforming special education would be more teacher support, having behavior techs who can pop into the classroom at any time when things get rough. Because with a broad spectrum of children with different qualifying conditions, uh, things that don't always work smoothly, especially with large numbers like 16 and a mild, moderate, special class. So teacher support and behavior tax, I, I would highly recommend in my 18 years. But I'm here to talk about, not about that or about the two students of the year from Freedom Elementary who I was brought before the board in past years, but to talk about safe ag, safe schools and how we're looking at certain schools like Ohlone, which has elevated uh, chromium six, levels, uh, but also has pesticides uh, being applied uh, in the square mile that covers 
Ohlone Elementary. In 2017, according to the Tracking California Pesticide Mapping Tool Online, the latest year for which we have data, 17,488 pounds of carcinogens were applied in the square mile of which Ohlone forms the eastern boundary. And Karen, that's your district, and I'm sure you're familiar with some of that. Fortunately, through the hard work of a Melissa Dennis and other Ohlone teachers, the immediate uh, adjacent farmland has gone organic. And that's a real, in what Melissa called, a, suggested as a zone of innovation. Nonetheless, t -lone, which is 1,3-dichloropropene, a gas pumped in to kill every living thing in the soil, a fumigant, and then when the tarp is removed, those gases travel long distances. That was number one of the carcinogens applied in that block. Malathion, uh, an organophosphate related to chlorpyrifos, which we've worked to get Governor Newsom to rescind the registration on, is number three. And our old friend glyphosate, which has been banned by the district and, uh, and by the city of Watsonville on city property, uh, Roundup was number four of carcinogens in that block. Mr. Wright has two minutes. So. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Renaissance similarly has high levels of pesticide. So what we're trying to do is reduce those pesticide exposures, uh, carcinogenic in particular, and, and also chromium-6 in drinking water in support of, of uh, the community water service. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I would, if you could pull up the uh, Krishna slide. Yep. So I'm George Feldman. I am a teacher at Ohlone and a local resident and one of the people who's inhaling and drinking everything in the system out at Ohlone. Uh, I wanted to thank the district because the district is moving forward. We're seeing movement from Mr. Dominguez. We're seeing movement from Dr. Rodriguez. We're seeing support on the board from board member Amundsen. And also Mr. Rose was here earlier from the water board. We're getting support. We need to push the forward, though, with this. And we need to push forward with family communication. This weekend, my special project will be to spend the day changing the plumbing and add a, a filter that will pull out the uh, chromium-6 from our kitchen sink. My kids need that, too. They need that at their place of education. It's a toxin, not one of the huge ones that we're getting, but it is one that we can control and we can decrease. The graph here has the list at 10 of the historically, the historic limit, and at the red line, you will see the average levels at Ohlone right now. And the green line on the bottom is the medically safe level. So I hope we can all push forward. I hope we can get meetings with ELAC at Ohlone to inform the parents and move forward the situation with them. And also frequent communication with Mr. Dominguez, and the other members of the board and the school community who are pushing this forward. I'm looking forward to cooperating with you. Thank you. So, was it Krishna Feldman? That is correct. Thank I'm you. his wife. <laughs> so hello, uh, my name is Krishna Feldman. I'm a librarian at Ol Ohlone Elementary School, but I also have a master's degree in environmental science. And when I w found out that we have chromium-6 in our uh, well water that's uh, given to Ohlone, I was disturbed and I started delving into it. And I did all this background research and I went into the scientific data to look at the studies that they did. And it's like, yes, this is an issue. It's not the biggest issue that's facing us, but it's something that we can tackle now by getting, bringing in safe drinking water, bottled water, because there is a grant for that. And I actually looked at Pure Water and I looked at their water quality and they're good. So it's like, okay, we can move forward with this. I think we can get a free grant. So as George pointed out, 
the in 2000, I believe, 11, the EPA, California EPA, came up with the green line, which is the, the healthy level, which you have graphs of this on your second page that you should have received, the board members, a picture of the graph, and that is the public health uh, goal. And that's where you expect no problems from it, okay? And uh, then uh, later, four, three years later, they developed this, the 10 parts per billion of, uh, for chromium-6, and that's based more on economics and feasibility and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, it was thrown out after three years, so we only have three years of data. The reason why they threw out that um, maximum contaminant level, the legal limit, was because of um, they didn't dot all their I's and cross all their T's with an economic analysis to show economic feasibility. But the court that threw it out said, please come up with another MCL soon. You have background information from the water companies that did change over to be accountable. And, um, and hopefully you can come up with one soon. But it's been two years, nothing yet. Maybe in two more years they'll come up with it. But that is one of the long-term goals that I hope the board can help push forward is that we can um, help the state put this max um, back in place. Because when that happens, we can, we can move forward with the long-term plan, which is to maybe mingle our water with Aparo water so that um, we don't have to bring in bottled water. Um, again, our average is 13 parts per billion at Ohlone when we were measuring it, and this is a long-term problem. It's not going to go away. And I would <laughs> encourage us to get this water to us because we're trying to help our students. I feel a moral obligation to make sure that, okay, the 10 parts per billion or the 50 parts per billion that is currently in place for total chromium doesn't, isn't a level for health, it's an economic level. And I think we can do better than that, especially when we're being offered a free grant. And I thank you so much, Karen Amundsen and Dr. Rodriguez, and my friend Joe, who is <laughs> working on this issue. And I just, I would like clarity, um, maybe a monthly update on what's going on. And um, yeah, thank you very thank much. Thank you. So the next three speakers, we have Melissa Dennis, Chris Webb, and Josefina Rodriguez. All right. I think that um, that talk we just had about special ed is actually a perfect segue into this discussion about water just because of what my colleagues t um, said earlier. And um, thank you for, do you want to leave the graph up? Oh yeah, go ahead. You can leave it up. Um, we do have a lot of students with cancer. I think we counted in the last four years, about five students who have cancer. This last week, we've had two kids that had doctor's appointments related to their cancer. Last year, I had a student um, who was blind because she uh, had cancer. Now, I don't know why we have so many students with cancer, but um, these are just things that weigh on us. And when we hear that there's other contaminants, we want to deal with it with a sense of urgency because it connects to all these problems that we're talking about. It connects to the special ed. It, connects to our health and it connects to our learning. So uh, yeah, as you know, I teach at Ohlone and my biggest concern today is that we let the parents know because um, as soon as we heard that um, there was a problem with the water, some staff decided to stop drinking the water. But the parents haven't had that opportunity to make that decision for themselves yet. Um, I personally am drinking it as long as my students are drinking it, but I do respect my colleagues who've decided to stop drinking it. Um, <clears throat> Joe and Ruth came to our staff meeting a couple weeks ago, and they said they're dedicated to transparency, and I think that's great, and I think that's what we need to do, and I think transparency means letting the parents know. Um, <clears throat> um, our portables already receive good quality um, water in dispensers. It's delivered regularly. We found out that it's good water. We already pay for that from our district. If we were to get this grant, that would actually save our district money because it's money we're already spending and then it would be a cost-saving measure. Um, <clears throat> and, the, and the service would be expanded to all the classrooms, not just the classrooms that don't have sinks. Um, and we know that our chromium-6 levels are consistent, consistently higher than the previous MCL. Um, so I just believe, despite the fact that we don't have a legal obligation to do anything, we do have a moral obligation to do something. And we have to do whatever is in our power to inform all parties to work to correct the problem as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Chris Webb. I'm from Renaissance, and uh, I want to just echo some of the comments I've heard. I thank I want to thank Joe and Ruth for coming by and bringing a level of transparency to this issue to our staff. Um, they presented us with the Consumer Confidence Report, and we have 20 parts per billion, so we're above Ohlone with the chromium. And uh, I think one thing that would make me more confident and it would improve transparency is because we're going on this legal limbo, uh, there's not a distinguishing between chromium-6 and chromium-3 in the report. I feel like that would be a, a big improvement. Also, um, the report's informed by monthly tests, and I, you know, we get an annual report, or hopefully we'll continue to get an annual report at least, but I think it'd be good to have monthly uh, data as well, and then maybe we could start looking into like where is this coming from? And if, if perhaps this is an economic problem wherein like local industry is responsible, in that case, the district shouldn't be obligated to pay. It should be those industries that should be funding perhaps a long-term solution for Renaissance. And I'm, I'm glad too that um, with Joe and, and Ruth, we do have the bottle service that Ohlone is seeking. Um, and, it, and we're having an improved distribution of that. Uh, I think it would have been a real inequity if we would have had to keep uh, paying for that out of site discretionary. It would have been wrong for our kids. So I'm really glad that we got that much at least. So if we could get a little bit more transparency just on distinguishing and then uh, distinguishing between six and three and then getting those monthly reports. So thank you. Thank you. Buenas noches para todos. Mi nombre es Josefina Rodríguez y soy una madre que está muy preocupada. Sí. Buenas noches para todos. Soy una madre que tiene dos hijos en Oloni y una tía que también tiene más sobrinos en Oloni y estoy muy preocupada por la salud de mis hijos, por el agua. Y queremos pedir agua limpia en Oloni. Queremos que. I'm a mother that has two children in Oloni and an aunt that has one. I'm very worried about the quality of the water for my children and my nephews. Queremos que nuestros hijos tengan buena salud. El agua es muy importante. Es lo es lo más importante del ser humano. Entonces queremos. I want our children to have good health. Their water is very important for the health. Queremos pedirles buena salud para todos los niños de Oloni y muchas gracias por su atención. And, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. All right, the final three speakers are Sara Ait Martinez, Kathleen Kilpatrick, and Jeremy Montez Sr. Hello everyone, good night. I am Erika Reola, the community organizer for Stay Back Safe Schools. Stay Back Safe Schools is a coalition of, a hundred, of more, than 50, uh, more than 50 organizations and it was mostly funded by PBF t teachers, community members, parents and students worried about pesticide exposure around their schools. And today I wanna say thank you to the board for allowing me the space and more than anything, I um, wanna say that I'm proud to be working with this community and I want to say thank you to the district because they have led the way on setting an example at the state level. Thanks to your leadership, uh, we are uh, supporting buffer sounds. Uh, there is also notifications going on. And of course, the cancellation of chlorpyrifosate brain damaging pesticide. And tonight, I am here to support uh, community center water uh, because it's important that our students have clean water. And therefore, my ask for you tonight it's what can the board provide us with short and long-term solutions to contribute to the health of our children and our community when it comes to water safety. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel, am I next? Okay, Kathleen Kilpatrick, retired school nurse. I haven't been here for a while. Um, you know, it's really important that our Families know that their tap water is safe to drink. A lot of people come from Mexico, they drink out of the big 
gallon jug. I drink out of the big gallon, five gallon jug because the water doesn't taste so great. But they don't really even know that the tap water is safe and they need to know that because hydration of our children is really important. Um, I was uh, invited by uh, the Community Water Center to attend a meeting with Superintendent Rodriguez, but I was not allowed to attend. Um, and so I wanted to address some of the issues that came up out of that meeting that I felt like were misperceptions. Um, also, I was uh, invited to the meeting at Ohlone and I was not allowed to ask questions. So um, we do need more transparency. Uh, so uh, th the district is technically not out of compliance um, because there is no level, but in those three years when the level was in effect, the water at, at uh, Renaissance and Lonely was higher than the level. It's not the district's fault per se because the water systems are high, but um, it, as, as people have said, um, both schools would qualify for free water through this grant program, and they don't have to admit any guilt. It's, it's free money and no guilt. Um, the superintendent said super, that water distribution at Renaissance was not going well. It's going better now. Thank you for that. Um, and it's also working well in the portables at Ohlone. Um, and um, I'm really grateful that uh, after all those years, we didn't even have drinking water in the portables that, that it's available now. But I think that the rest of the kids deserve to have um, good water as well. And the, the um, water from the, the company has been shown to be better than the water out of the tap. Uh, I know both the superintendent and, and uh, Mr. Dominguez talked about parity. Um, as an issue that why shouldn't the other schools also have access to this water because it is true that there are high levels in some of the Watsonville wells. But we know uh, that uh, parity is a theory, but in schools pilots happen and not all the schools get the same thing. So I think it would be good to consider this a pilot level and also to collaborate with the city of Watsonville and the neighboring water, water districts to make sure that those long-term solutions are being worked on. And one of the ways that that can be done is for the board and the, the um, school to come out in support of that level of um, 10 parts per million for the uh, maximum contaminant level, which is being stalled at the state. But you have, as elected officials, power to say, hey, what's going on with that? And to, to put your voice forth because we want not just short-term solutions, but long-term solutions so that we can all drink out of the tap. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your years as a service as a school nurse. And next, oh, Jeremy. Good evening. Um, heard a lot about Chrome 6. Um, my name is Jeremy Montes Sr. and I'm a water operator, distribution operator, and a treatment operator. Um, here in the South County. I'm very familiar with with a lot of the sites that they're talking about and with these numbers. Um, but let's just take a second to understand that the federal government has set a total chromium number and, and that number is, you know, if, if we followed that graph, it would be somewhere around that light right there. And that would be 100. So some of the questions were, what's the difference between uh, hex chrome and trivalent chrome. And the differences are when we've sampled out here, we've seen that 95% of the total chromium is hex chrome and 5% is trivalent chrome. So then if we look at the, the federal government's number of 100 and historically California wanted to do better than that and so they put it at 50, what would that number be? But what we're looking at is 10. And it doesn't matter how we feel about it. When that MCL is set, we all have to get to work on it. And we have to meet these things. We have to be compliant. And that's what, that's what I've seen happen a lot. Um, at Renaissance High School, there was, uh, when they were near the MCL for nitrates, right away, a new well went in to care of that. But a lot of these things are going to keep popping up. Um, one of them is um, there was talk about fumigants. 123TCP. Um, PFAS, this is a molecule that was used a lot in fire retardants. So these things are constantly being monitored, quarterly monitoring and things like that. And action plans are being put in place. But right now, the, the, uh, there is no MCL for it. The district um, is in full compliance. 
as are the areas all along San Andreas Road. That will be around 20. That would include SoCal Creek, and that would also include City of Watsonville. Everybody has to make a move to become compliant once the MCL is set, okay? So, so what's gonna be happening? We're all gonna be acting, right? But we have to do it once the MCL is set, and until then, there won't be any success to say, to get a grant if you're not out of compliance. The grant's set there for being out of compliance. So let's just be aware of that, um, and that the district is doing a wonderful job of staying in compliance, and all that's a matter of public record. Thank you very much. For everyone that came up and sp spoke to us, thank you. <laughs> um, so now um, we're actually going on to the unions to have them come up if they would like to do that. Pottle Valley Federation of Teachers. Hi, good evening. Hi, Nelly. Good evening, board. <laughs> good evening, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, Maria, thank you for acknowledging the tireless work teachers invested in advocating for the transparency with private charter schools of char private charter schools. I do want to also make, want to make that clear that um, it is for those private charter schools because dependent charters are already transparent because you're the board, <laughs> um, and it comes from our computer, from our elected community. Um, so recently, our CFT president wrote that when labor unions fight for education, we also fight for social justice. And tonight, I think a lot of has been mentioned in regards to social justice. Um, we fight for social justice, racial justice, gender equity, LGBTQ rights, and climate justice. Thus, we rally to improve the lives of our youth, edu youth educators and community. So thank you to uh, Daniel Dodge, to um, Jennifer Holm, and to Jennifer Shocker. I know you guys show up. I know you do a lot with the nurses as well, um, but you are role models for our youth and um, you sh you know, showing up to rallies is important. Um, we are all educators. I lost my place. <laughs> um, so PVFT has aided in the growth of two social justice community organizations. They were mentioned. Um, safe Ag, Safe Schools, uh, teachers, that's mainly, it was teachers being organized um, and aided with the help of um, an advocate, an advocate, it's like Sarait in Safe Ag, Safe Schools. And we have spoken um, with, uh, we've spoken in public hearings in regards to pesticides near our schools. So SAS, is something that has um, done a lot of good for our community. And we also have Regeneración, another organization that's grown out of PBFT. That's um, Nancy Falstich, who was um, also worked for in our district. And that is for climate justice. And so we had, she was a big part of our local organization for um, the youth climate justice rally that we had. So, and educators help out a lot. And that again was mentioned that you know, teachers were um, teachers were seen with their students uh, at at these rallies. So again tonight we've heard um, the urgency of need for clean water for our students and the community as well. And so the district has been invited, and I know that um, I, I've gone, I've met with Joe and Ruth, and I went to um, Ohlone and I saw their presentation um, and I've met with uh, the Community Water Center several times. But so really the, the conversation is now at the table with the district. And so the district has been invited to join this social justice cause because that's what it is. And um, we hope that you show up. And uh, that's pretty much it on the social justice piece. And uh, so, board, we are in negotiations. Uh, one, some of the areas that are really important to PVFT is SELPA, and um, as well as wages, 
safety and um, health and welfare benefits. So we hope that when you are informed of where we're at, that you um, maybe learn more about budgets and uh, you know ask questions. You can ask us too. Thank you. Thank you. So the California School Employees Association Union, they're here. So how about the Pottle Valley Association of Managers? Nobody wants to come up. <laughs> and then lastly, of course, I've never seen them here before, Communication Workers of America. Um, So we've done that one, 8.1. Okay, now we're on 8.2. Yeah. <clears throat> so we've done 8.1, and so we're gonna do 8.2, which is the PG and E EV fleet electrification, electrification <laughs> program invitation with Katie Powell, our transportation director. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Good evening, President Osmussen, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. I'm here tonight to um, seek approval for us to join partnership with PG&E in the Make Ready um, incentive option that they've offered us for our infrastructure for our electric buses that we were awarded in our CEC grant. Um, this is the preliminary steps that we need to take so that we can get everything ready for those buses to be deployed. Um, and so I'm just seeking your approval to move forward with PG&E. Yes. So, so, yeah, comments? So, um, these are new buses that will no. be purchased? No, no, they're not. <laughs> Eventually, they're gonna... we will be awarded grant buses, uh, but new electric buses with grant money, yes. But the buses they're going to use are, they're going to be using buses that we have and convert them to electricity, right? No. Oh. We've been awarded new buses. This, this backup was very, it wasn't very clear. So okay. can you just explain what's happening and sure. what you're asking us to vote on tonight? Sure. Yeah. We went with a grant application with the California Energy Commission and we were awarded eight electric buses. So what that means is they've awarded us $2.9 million for buses and $480,000 for infrastructure. Um, since we have zero infrastructure, we need to start from the ground up, literally, um, putting that infrastructure in. So what I did was I reached out to EV Fleet Ready when they were doing onboarding to see if they could help us and offset the cost of that infrastructure. So what they have offered is to bring um, to the meter, is what it's called, so from the power supply to the meter, and then what we would do is um, from the meter to the charging point with the grant money that was awarded during this, through the CEC. So that's what we're doing. Thank you. That answered the second part of my question, too. So. Uh -huh. Kim, go ahead. Um, so where is this? Is this going to be at where? The dis district office? or where 196 Grimmer Road, where we have our bus yard. The bus yard. Mm -hmm. So do we have any solar arrays there? Like, would that we be don't. helpful? That would be helpful. Because we're going to, aren't we going to have to pay for all this electricity? We are. Well, so do, the 480 thousand dollars for infrastructure can any of that be used for solar arrays or is that only going to cover the cost of bringing the electricity to the meters no i believe that we can look into getting solar with that as well okay i'd like to do that if we can sure look into that that way it would be no cost or cost neutral to the district thank you yeah All right, <laughs> we're gonna vote on it. <laughs> huh? I'll make a, a second. Okay, I will call for a vote. All in the favor. Aye. 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 So that's now it's one, two, three, four, five. You have to go over here. You, you over here. Are you voting? Wait, <laughs> quickly go over here. <laughs> six. It's gonna be six, zero, one. Okay. Um, so we yeah. did it, 601. Thank All you. All those in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That's very exciting. Thank you. 
All right. This is kind of exciting too. This is the agreement with Code to the Future, also for Ohlone Elementary. We have it in one other school and it's now gonna be in Ohlone. Report by Michelle Rodriguez, yeah. Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, so thank you. So as you know, we started, and now a year and a half ago, we started the first computer science immersion school, um, elementary computer science immersion school at Valencia Elementary. Part of the pilot to scale process that we use is um, once we feel like a pilot is solidified and we've worked out any kinks that we need to work out, um, then we expand or what's called the scale part. Um, so as a form of equity, we always try to have a balance to where we have both a north and south zone component. This is not a program because of the cost and just the uniqueness of it. Um, it's not a program that we will scale out 100%. When you say scale, it doesn't mean that it would go to every school, um, but it will increase and it, um, it will specifically build um, towards our computer science pathway with, that we now have at both sixth grade and that we have um, now, and you heard from our students at PVHS, that we now have at the high school level. Um, so the goal of this is for um, Ohlone Elementary. So what we did is we had a meeting with all the elementary principals. Ohlone stepped forward as wanting to do that. Um, she had um, conversations with her leadership team and they wanted to move forward. So this would allow them to begin the training. They would actually be trained the two days before we come back from winter break. So we have a three week break. Um, so it would be the Thursday and Friday before um, the winter break ends. Um, they would be doing um, one to two of, so there's actually three different components. Um, they would start with the scratch um, epic build. So each um, unit ends in an epic build. Um, if you've been, if you have a chance to um, go um, Valencia and we'll put it in our weekly communication, but Valencia has their epic build coming up, their first epic build and that's with scratch. Um, so basically what the students do is they take a program, they learn the program scratch and they make their own um, game, um, video game. Um, the second one is always Lego Robotics and third is Minecraft. This year Valencia will do all three of the epic builds. This year Ohlone will at, do at least one epic build with the scratch. Um, and then they will build on to that after the as the years move forward. Um, so their team is really excited about it. We're excited to have this opportunity um, for our South Zone schools. Once it's um, really well known, um, we will wind up having students that want to through school choice to go to those schools um, and they're able to. So um, because of California law, they're able to do that. So I'm hoping um, to get um, your approval, you'll see that this is a much less cost um, than the previous one, and that's because we're capitalizing on um, the current partnership. Any comments? That's an exciting opportunity um, for the kids at Ohlone. How many more schools will we be rolling out to in the future? Well, we, we know we want to do at least two more because we want to look at feeder patterns going in. So we definitely need to do an elementary school that has a feeder pattern going into Cesar Chavez. Um, and so we, we don't have, um, we have it works through with the staff, but it would be something like an HA Hive that has a direct connection with Cesar Chavez Middle School. Um, and then we would um, most likely um, want to do one more in the North Zone as well, or at least a Central. That's great. I'll make a motion to support. Second. <laughs> All, those in, oh. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? So the 601. Okay. Last is, so we're still, are we? 8.4. I mean, I'm just saying we're still on time. 
8.4, approved memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and Ventura County Office of Education, and that would be by Dr. Chona Killeen. Yes, thank Assistant you, Superintendent. Thank you, President Osmondson, <laughs> Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. This is a state-approved induction program for teachers in specialized areas, such as uh, career technical education and adult education, so that they can clear their preliminary designated subjects credentials. It's similar to BITSA, um, beginning teacher support and assessment that we do with uh, the new teacher project for general education K-12 teachers to provide a systematic structure of support. Um, and some of the program highlights uh, that uh, include Ventura County Office of Education um, providing job embedded local context application in program design, promoting professional practice among candidates, coaches, and all stakeholders, providing online and face-to-face -face and online coursework for CTC approved programs, providing qualified instructions for classes and coursework, providing distance support to all mentors and field-based supervisors, phone, email, monthly updates, uh, and communicating with directors uh, about candidate completion data, among many other uh, responsibilities. In exchange for us, um, our role is, in addition to paying the fees of about 2800 50 per teacher to help the teacher clear their credential. Um, we will also provide a site mentor for local support of the candidate. Okay, <laughs> any comments from the board? <laughs> you have one? Jennifer Holm. I, I have uh, two questions. One, how many teachers do we expect to participate in this? Um, we're looking at about up to 10 teachers. Yeah, we have currently two um, because we we did this year um, pilot um, taking over the career technical ed, uh, CTE um, for our district. And I, I saw that you know we are paying a, a big chunk of the fees. There is a, a smaller chunk that the teachers are responsible for. Yes. Do they pay all of that at once? And has there been any indication that that's a hardship? Um, we've not had any indication that it's a hardship and some of the fees it can be broken down like for example if they took a health class you know somewhere else um, that that's hundred and twenty three dollars that's taken off the the 695 fee that they have to take but the the vast majority of, of the fees involve you know for the teachers to pay for clearing their credential which is a normal um, fee that that teachers pay thank you mm -hmm. Any other comments? I, I have a question. So I'm looking at this contract, and um, I was looking at there the fees are. So what what is what is the total to clear each teacher? Um, our total is uh, twenty eight fifty. Two thousand eight hundred fifty. Yes. And um, Ventura has like just this, they've just honed the process of getting these teachers through. So. It, so it's a way for them to generate revenue for their district. Yes. It's the COE or it's the actual? It's the County Office of it Education. Is. Yeah. So this is not something we would want to do ourselves? Um, we, it ha it goes, we have to go through a special licensing process, which um, takes um, quite, a while, quite a while to do. And this is, they're doing the same thing that the new teacher project is uh, doing for our um, general education teachers. And it is a very, complicated, complex licensing um, endeavor um, to be able to provide this kind of service. Okay, I'm just always trying to think of ways to generate revenue so that we have a, a more richer budget so that we can pay our teachers more. Yes, <laughs> and our, and thank you. <laughs> so if we thank do you. anything really, really well and you can think of ways that we could actually do some business, uh, yeah. bring it for forward, others, please. Too. Maybe yes. for other places, yes. you could do it for other places. <laughs> okay, I'll, I would like to make a motion to approve this if there's no further questions. Second. Uh, question. Uh, Georgia has one. Um, Chona, so I, I'm just curious, why is it that we are working with an affiliate so far away from our county? Um, we, we are going with Ventura because Ventura has the program because these are specialized credentials. They're designated subjects credentials, not the typical um, credential that we have for our K-12 
and even our um, special education teachers. So these are specialized credentials and they're the ones with the, the license, um, you know, to be able to, you know, to, that meet the state requirements to be able to clear the credentials. And so are you saying that our neighboring tri-counties between Santa Clara, San Benito, and Monterey County, and even our own county, Santa Cruz County, this is non-existent, and the, the best the, and closest that we get is yes. Ventura? Yes, is Ventura is, is where we're going through. No, I Gosh. understand that's where you're going through, but I'm saying, are you saying that is the absolute closest mm -hmm. to us? Yes, so that, even Santa Cruz um, County Office of Education, this is who they went through for their CT program. Okay. So when, even when we had, even when we were through COE, um, they went through Ventura for their CT program. And so it's a very specialized um, service, and so that we just continue to maintain. We, of course, can continue to look for different places. This is who we have been using for the last five years um, as we were using um, the Santa Cruz County Office of Ed. But we can definitely look to make sure. Um, I will say that, um, although to her chagrin, um, eventually we want to take in at least our BITSA, which is our regular general education teachers, um, just because of the cost um, of expense. Um, and so this is something for us to consider. Um, CTE credentialing is really challenging um, just because of all the different um, waivers and the different requirements that they're required to have. And so currently, uh, you, you elaborate on Santa Cruz County, Santa Clara mm -hmm. County Office of Ed, San Benito County Office of Ed, Monterey County Office of Ed, none of us four county, none of the four county Office of Eds have this. So. I, I did not actually say that. What I said was see, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, that is who they have directed us to for the last five years. Right. So we, what we did in an effort to be efficient is we went with them to develop this MOU. We can definitely look um, at the other regions and confirm that they are, in fact, the best. I know when... We worked with the COE. This is who they said, this is where you should send your teachers. And so we just continued with that pathway. So it is possible that they, um, that those other counties have it. I'm not going to say that for sure definitively they don't. Um, but there was a reason why the Santa Cruz COE used them for the last multiple years. And if I remember reading correctly in the backup, this MOU is just for the 2019-2020 school year? Yes. So we do we can look at that going yeah, forward. And we definitely okay. can. All right. Thank you for answering the questions and I'd certainly like to have that investigated a little further. Sure. Thank you. Already a motion and a second. Correct. Already a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Six zero, no, seven zero one. <laughs> seven zero. Seven zero, I mean, not one. Seven zero. <clears throat> okay. Um, we're on. So we're now doing 8.5. We're going to approve the memorandum of understanding between Santa Cruz, Silicon Valley, new teacher project with us. So, Dr. Chona Killeen, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. <laughs> Thank you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. We have a great many teachers at our district and very proud to be part of that. And um, many organizations want to take our teachers for mentoring and coaching responsibilities for their own organizations. Currently, we, there are four um, PVUSD teachers um, that are certificated employees in our districts that's on loaner um, and who are currently working with the Santa Cruz Silicon Valley New Teacher Project as full release mentors. And they have caseloads of up to 18 participating teachers for whom responsibilities include weekly coaching. And the mentors also attend forums twice a month, attend professional development training when appropriate, and facilitate collaborative learning communities. In addition, the mentors meet with site administrators on a quarterly basis to review site goals and um, implement each teacher's induction plan. In exchange for these services, 
um, the Santa Cruz um, Silicon Valley New Teacher Project agrees to pay us um, $60,000 per release teacher towards the cost of replacement for a total reimbursement of $240,000. And there was a little bit of a, uh, an error um, that it's um, to Pajaro, not to Santa Cruz City Schools, that they're paying for us to loan the, the teachers. So pardon the error. And you'll note because it wasn't a material change, um, that contract has been updated to have the correct label. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's good. <laughs> Just have oh. one question, if I may. Um, so I'm assuming that we have built enough capacity within our district to be able to provide this service to an outside organization. So that's what I was speaking to prior, that we would have to um, get the proper licensing in order to be able to do this. Um, so our teachers definitely have enough skill for it. What we have to do is we have to go through the certification process. And so that's what I was meaning for the general education teachers. I would like us to have our own bits of program. I think um, we're at the cusp of a normal school district that would either do it or not do it. We're right about at that area. So some our size choose definitely not to do it and some of our size choose to do it. Um, as you all know from the contract, we pay a significant, in this case it's, it's the reverse, but we pay, you saw the significant um, contract that we have with New Teacher Project. Um, it's a requirement for our teachers, so we don't have a choice but to do, do it, but I think taking it in-house would be good. It would mean, I just want to point out, it would mean more administrators, so very similar to when we took over CTE, we added an administrator. Mm -hmm. It would require us to take back the program, which costs us like 600 and some thousand mm -hmm. dollars for a new teacher project, so it would mean a full-time person that that's what that administrator did. Um, but in the end, it would wind up saving us money. And um, I think the, the benefit of doing this is we do get them back well trained. First of all, right now, while we don't have our own bits of program, for instance, um, well, I probably shouldn't use his name, but our, um, so our coordinator of gifted and talented um, was one of our teachers, went, got highly trained as a coach for those two years, came back and is now doing exceptional work for us, right? So we get our teachers back. Um, and a high, more highly trained in coaching than we had in the past. But eventually, we do want to do that, but it would require us to bring on more admin staff because, because we're dealing with the credentials of teachers. Um, it's not something that we can make as somebody else's um, job description. It would have to be someone that that's what they do and that's what they focus on. Um, but it, it could eventually save us um, money to be able to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more comments? Okay. I would like to move approval. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Seven zero. Okay, 8.6. And this is approval of independent contractor agreement for facilities master planning services. And this is presented by Joe Dominguez, our CBO. All right, uh, good evening, uh, board president, members of the board, superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, this evening, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, provide uh, uh, some really um, uh, strategic planning and uh, foresight on behalf of our purchase and procurement department of uh, facilities and planning division uh, there was a lot of work that went in through this process and I'd like to commend the team uh, Richard Ariano and Ryan block uh, for their efforts um, so tonight we have uh, a contract for Maddie architects and planning to assist the district in completing and uh, updating and revising a uh, district-wide facilities master plan uh, the difference from this plan to the previous, I believe, 2012 uh, master plan is that we will also look at infrastructure and facility needs, but this plan will also be centered on our, our district vision and mission and our target for student success. So we will actually look at uh, the program needs, whether that's career tech education, dual immersion, uh, Latino Film Institute, et cetera, and making sure that the, we have the right space 
and or uh, facilities available to have these programs successful. And that's something that um, the previous plan did not capture and or special programs that we discussed in a previous board meeting, which are our SELPA and other uh, uh, programs that we have for our students. Our previous plan is approximately nine years old. Uh, best practices, which we are implementing throughout the district, uh, districts should revise every five years. And then districts are required to provide a current facilities master plan within two years when we go out for a bond election. So this uh, master plan will be completed uh, mid next year and so this would position the district if we choose to in if uh, in the next two years or uh, actually two outgoing years uh, if we were to go and pursue a bond election we meet that requirement um, the other component that we were just uh, recently informed is governor Newsom signed in uh, recently in uh, of this year to move forward for a March 2020 um, 15 billion dollar statewide school bond legislation uh, so the state is going to move forward uh, in March 2020 with their school uh, statewide bond. And so we want to make sure that our master plan is up updated and we have the support of the current needs. Um, with that uh, being said, we have Maddie Architects and Planning here with us uh, this evening. And I'd like to invite uh, Mariana, Andrew, and Presley to come up to the podium. And they have a presentation for us. And we'll also take questions. Good evening. There you go. Thank you, Board of Trustees, uh, Superintendent, Assistant Superintendents. I'm honored to be here and having the time in this busy night to introduce myself and the team and um, get to know you and uh, talk a little bit about what we do. Um, again, Presley uh, is a project coordinator, is one of the uh, key members of the work that we do, as well as Andrew Fullerton, his project manager, excellent communicator. and. Uh, will be part of our efforts. So I'll be, I'll go fast through this. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do. We are um, architects. We do everything from planning uh, from the very beginning through construction, and we do this through trust-based relationships. This is not only in-house, but with our team of consultants and obviously with our clients. Um, our, our values are, um, you know, to give exceptional service. Um, we uh, are passionate about what we do, and our, uh, one of our, our values is that we own it. I like what you have that is all in is very, is very similar. So we value everybody's um, uh, work, and that's what, how we translate it into our job. Um, this is all the services that we do, but I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, but basically, in a, in, in a nutshell, we we work from small modernizations to full full construction and school replacement. We've done modernization of portable buildings, and we've done a, a brand new buildings and um, from from scratch, as well as working on master planning. And that's why we're here tonight. Uh, we are uh, local. We have offices in Santa Cruz, um, an office in, in San Jose, and we recently opened one in Sacramento. Um, the company was uh, founded in 2005, and we have covered the footprint that is shown here. Um, but in the last uh, few years, we've been very active in Santa Cruz County, um, uh, covering a lot of uh, work in master planning and new projects such as a Soquel School District, Santa Cruz City Schools, Mountain Elementary, Live Oak, and we're already doing some, some, some projects with, uh, with Pajaro Valley. Um, some of our team members, um, Ralph LaRue is uh, one of the co-founders, and he couldn't come here tonight. Uh, he's enjoying a very well-deserved vacation. Um, and um, we also have uh, other staff um, that is supporting uh, all the work that, that we do, and we're very proud of it. Um, really quickly, um, this is kind of a, an organization of how we would work. We have a team of consultants um, from civil engineers, mechanical, electrical engineers that would be coming, verifying um, and helping us study the 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 master plans that uh, well, Joe Dominguez was mentioning, and we're going to be verifying and see what's the status, what has happened in these last nine years, and um, moving forward to creating the, the master plan. 
Um, these are all the people that are in our team. Um, they're local. We, again, through that trust-based relationships, as I mentioned, we work with these consultants many years, and uh, we know each other. We know when when we can have clear communication. We, we don't like something. We are very honest, and we say it, so uh, we trust that. Um, and here is how we would start. Um, we the target that uh, the district has put so much effort into developing and understanding what's important is what's going to be the driver of our evaluation and put into the master plan. Um, so when we assess the facilities and the spaces on the outdoor areas and everything that each site has, we will have in, in, in mind um, the target that the district has. Um, in fact, we're going to print a poster of it and put it on our, <laughs> on our office while we work on this. Um, Again, it's the driver for creating the, the document, such, such as um, um, creating a high quality learning environment. Um, the collaboration is very important, and um, also the meaning, meaningful relationships that you have identified in these targets. Um, so how the process will be, we're collecting the data. We already have received a lot of documentation uh, that has been provided to us. We're sorting through it. We can evaluate, we're, we're studying already the previous master plans, um, and uh, we're gonna have a series of meetings to develop some goals, and then um, meet with each uh, school site and um, have community, community meetings so we can also have consensus and input from them and um, put all this together. Um, and then developing the plan, of course, and, and um, prepare a document, a living document that can um, show what the priorities are. So that's that's what we do. We bring our consultants and check on things. Um, uh, we have experience in in um, in meetings, in facilitating community meetings. Um, we we have done it in 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 Spanish as well. Um, so we try to communicate the work as we go and make sure that everybody's heard. Um, Ralph always always prides on the photo here on the bottom on the bottom left uh, when we get the thumbs up after the, the, the meetings. Um, so this is an example of one of the projects that we've done. We, for Live Oak School District, uh, after identifying and gathering all the data, we, we, we work on the priorities uh, as they were uh, identified by the group. Uh, we develop a series of plans um, identifying those goals. Um, we put along uh, budgets uh, per site. There's columns uh, there that's showing the site. So if, if there's a site that is needing the fire alarm upgrades because another one was having it, it's an easy way of reading the chart to see what is missing on each of them. Um, so budget on one side, and then obviously the priori prioritization, um, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, more examples, uh, this is for Santa Cruz City Schools. Uh, we developed the master plan and we are already completing some of the work that includes modernization and um, some infrastructure and also new, new construction. Um, we've also prepared exhibits and support documentation for grants. Um, so for example, uh, if the, there's CTE uh, grants that uh, the district wants to apply, we have provided uh, support for that. We have done some feasibility studies for other districts. Um, so that's part of the work that we, that we also do. Um, this is a utilization plan. Um, Presley uh, has been working a lot with the Santa Cruz City Schools in understanding what's where in each campus um, and, organize, and understanding at each, with the site administrators if that's what they want, or we need to to to, to group, um, you know, per grade or per per subject collaboration areas. Um, so these are very important to have them color coded and understand what works in each campus, and also make sure that throughout the district is uh, uh, cohesive. More examples. Um, we have also developed district standards in terms of materials, um, from lighting to to um, um, high efficiency mechanical equipment or how to um, upgrade existing uh, systems. Um, we also have an interior design department and sometimes that's, since, since, we, we, since we started this, this uh, department, it has, it has helped us evaluate the classrooms from inside out, starting from how students would move 
and then work, work our way out. So it's a good perspective that we're applying when we're um, uh, doing our work. And finally, uh, why us? Uh, we, we are local, we are vested, we have the experience, we have you know, 20 years of experience in working in educational projects, and we have worked with projects that were assigned to us based on a master plan done by other professionals, and we've seen what works and what doesn't work. So when we're working on this one for this district, we can understand and make sure that we ask the right, the right questions and address them in the master plan. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Did I, did I say everything? We're good? OK. So with that, we, um, one of the other pieces that is critical to this uh, facility master plan is we'll have approximately uh, a minimum of 30 community outreach meetings per site and throughout the district uh, as a whole. Um, and then we're also including um, a landscape and looking at our sites and how water conservation and green space and play fields and um, hardscape. So we're also looking how to be more efficient as a district and then utilization of our Prop 39 energy dollars. So we're, it's a broad, uh, big scope. Um, and uh, go ahead and open it for questions. No. No, the cards are all gone. <laughs> so is there any comments? Thank you guys for showing up. I'm always asking, you know, we're always looking at consultants and I'm always asking, you know, where is everybody at? So it's good to see people. Thank you. Thank you. So I do have a question. So are we, um, so are we looking to go after Yvonne in the near future? And if so, when will be the best? <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So I would say we have, what we have said is that we feel that we need to finish PBHS before we go out for another bond because that was a significant promise that was made. Um, and so we at least need to finish the athletic field. I think that's a conversation that we need to have with the board and if we want to move forward, um, then we need to start surveying and doing some polling and seeing how it how it goes. Regardless, um, one thing that I know the board has asked in terms of facilities is just being more proactive, knowing what is our highest level priority, whether it's using the money, the modernization money, whether it's using money um, for deferred maintenance that we now have to put aside, but what's our biggest priority where so that we're not kind of always behind the eight ball. This would allow us to do that. At the same token, um, if and when we feel that we're ready for a bond, um, then we would be primed to do that um, because we can't go after a bond um, with having a nine-year-old document. It's not, it, we wouldn't meet all the requirements. Um, so I think it's a two-pronged approach. It's trying to be more proactive and then also being ready um, when we feel the community is ready for another bond. Um, but I've been pretty, I've, I've been pretty forward with saying, um, especially until we get the field completely done, I don't think that we've, um, w I don't think we've completed enough promises to the community to get another one passed. Yeah. Um, and so as part of this process, I'm assuming we're looking into developing new priorities, right? So it's not just a matter of updating an old plan, it's looking at the needs at each school site and then determining what the community wants to see happen um, in addition to what's necessary, right? What do we need new roofs or whatever it may be? Yes, so it'll, it'll have like the nuts and bolts uh, infrastructure uh, code requirements component of it, but the centerpiece is the target for student success. So what is the program space and program need that we need to implement and move forward and support student achievement, student success? Um, so, for example, like uh, career tech education or fab labs, um, collaboration space. Um, so those are components that at different lens that we're going to approach this uh, a little okay. different. So it'll be, you could, it's safely to say that it will be both, right? Correct. Uh, both what we know 
schools needs to ensure that we move forward with certain programs or be able to expand those programs, but then also having the community input as to what they want to see within their school sites. Correct. And it also take into consideration um, factual, so the, the age and uh, condition of our facilities mm -hmm. and or uh, a great example that was talked about tonight, our, our plumbing and our water fountains, for example. So things like that nature will also be looked at. Okay. One of the things that I like to, would like to see as part of this plan is make sure that we have um, set aside some funding if we end up going after a bond uh, to ensure that we deal with, we have, you know, that fund that we deal with on person, on person situations where we don't have to take away money from a project to prioritize roofing or whatever it may be. And I know that's something that we had to do more than more one time this time around. And, and so that sort of creates that distrust among the community and our constituents. Well, we voted to do this in our school site, but you're taking money away now and investing it somewhere else. And so as much, you know, we're able to avoid that situation, I think would be to our benefit uh, to do so. I'll let Mariana chime in a little bit, but the, the plan will have uh, cost estimating uh, amounts associated with the different scopes. Um, one of the areas that we're also addressing a weakness in the previous plan, it also take into consideration inflation. Um, so mm -hmm. whether when this plan is complete next year, if we go out for a bond two years down the road, what does that cost associate with that uh, inflation? Okay. And so that we also have a contingency fund built and developed so we have the, the priority projects and we have the funding available to complete and make it happen, but also a contingency fund. And I don't know if you want to touch on that. That's right. We have a professional estimator that will be working on that. We're not going to be doing the, the architect's rough order of magnitude um, to support that work. And our part, our efforts going to be trying to understand and identify all those items. So you know, we, we prefer to give bad news up front than a surprise later on. Later on. Right. So we would like to identify as much as we can what is needed. Um, so then again, it's a full understanding of if we do this work, it triggers this other thing. And, and again, that is based on the lessons learned in all these years in working, both as receivers of a master plan and the ones generating it. Great, thank you. Just mm -hmm. a reminder, there's a five minute discussion. We still have one more presentation. I have a question. Yeah, um, um, Joe, the panel consisting of seven PBUSD staff members. Who were the seven staff members? So we had uh, facilities and planning, one representative, so Ryan Block, uh, Richard Ariano from Purchasing and Procurement, uh, three principals, uh, Watsonville High, uh, Aptos Jr., and then we had student services because another portion of the scope is not only capacity, but also enrollment mm -hmm. and attendance boundary. So it's, it's a full uh, loaded plan and Richard who else did we have on that panel um, and then we oh you? Uh, the actually this <laughs> this is another uh, we also had CSCA membership so we had our boots or our our uh, staff in the trenches so we had our HVAC and then we had a plumber and then we also had a um, I believe someone from uh, IT um, that is exactly what I was hoping to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and just to comment, um, Vice President Trustee Dodge um, and President Trustee Osmondson, um, the presentation on that went well over the time that was allotted for it. So while this was an important topic, so is everything else on our agenda. So I just, I don't know if that was a mishap on agenda setting committee staff or what, but just to keep the focus on that, that we're doing our due diligence to run these meetings on time. Well, I just want to ask, um, so when uh, Newsom is preparing to do a big, huge bond item on, I don't know if it's going to be devoted on or whatever, but I mean, um, is, is it, does it mean that we could apply for funds from that big, huge, gigantic bond 
proposal that he's putting he's going to be putting forward we can apply for funds from it right so if if uh, for march 2020 so if voters approve yes uh pajaro valley unified school district uh it'll prop 51 dollars that were pre the previous bond has already been allocated and so this will replenish the the bucket of funding and so for districts that have already been pre-approved or in in line to get funding which we are uh, we will get those and hopefully get those projects funded and then a new line forms with the additional funding So we will submit for additional projects so we can continue uh, getting funding Oh, That sounds good <laughs> That sounds hopeful <laughs> All right, okay, let's try to move on uh, do you want to one more question from uh, you? I have a few more questions. Uh oh. Um, okay, so the master plan that was put together in 2012 was incredibly extensive. Do you have a copy of that? Yes. Have you looked at right so you can see how extensive it is? Yes. So is it something that you'll add on to, or something that you have to completely redo because no. that was very extensively? Right. No, we definitely did not starting over. Uh, okay. It's it's data. Um, heavy and has a lot of the the physical parts and what buildings are owned what buildings are leased so we'll definitely start with that and we're gonna verify it and and again the focus this time is to have community input consensus and adopt the program um, the educational program and the target for student success with what those facilities have right now and comparing with what has been done in the last nine years but this is our starting point, definitely. So when we went out for the bond last time and we're preparing this from 2010 on, um, you know, it was estimated by the, by, you know, nine years ago dollars that we would need more than 300 million just to complete basic needs to bring mm -hmm. our facilities into basic repair. It didn't include any Future pie vision. in the sky or enhancement to. Right student learning or innovation or any of that. It was just the very bare basics because our facilities for so long had been left in disrepair because of the budgets, the devastating budgets that we all faced. So it's hard for me to think now because we only put in about 150 million, so that was less than half of what we needed to just do basic repairs. It's hard for me to understand how we can turn an eye towards innovation and spaces that are more creative when we have an incredible amount of basic repairs to do just mm -hmm. to bring our our facilities up so uh, so i don't i mean we and we have our community college going out for a 220 or thirty thousand dollar bond right now we already have multiple bonds on our taxes multiple bonds from cabrillo college and from pajaro valley um In my mind, just I'm going to say this publicly, I've said it before, K through 12 comes first. Our little kids and our high schoolers matter if you're going to be pitting community college versus regular ed. I, I do feel like, like our kids, our little kids and our teenagers and middle schoolers deserve to have basic infrastructure in our facilities. So mm -hmm. I, I'm going to say publicly I'm not going to support a $230 million bond for Cabrillo. Um, yes. <laughs> because I don't think it's fair when we have our kids in crumbling infrastructure still. So I'm not sure if they pass another bond how we would ever get another one passed here. So I'd like to know, so I heard you say that every five years um, is sort of standard for districts to come up with a facility master plan. And I, it's good for me to know because I was kind of wondering what are we doing. Um, if we don't go out for a bond, why is this information relevant? I think one of the, the primary components or another portion of the scope, it's a roadmap for your deferred maintenance plan. So right now, so another portion of implementing best practices, um, 07, 08 districts swept deferred maintenance funds into the general fund to deal with the layoffs and the recession. As time went on, you build up the, that fund and districts um, for us, for example, we do not have a deferred maintenance plan. So to your point, it addressed, the last plan addressed, well, this is your basic need, um, but didn't have any uh, financial forecasting associated with that. So this plan will have the a deferred maintenance plan, what need, the year, the lifespan, and you can speak to more of the technical piece, and I'll use like a HVAC, a air conditioning unit, 
the, the life of that is, is it 10 years, is it 15 years? When should we replace it? You better have budget allotment set aside in every 10 years, for example. And so that's what we're also gonna uh, complete in this process. And then also tee up and prepare the district if we were to go for a bond that we have the bond priority language and the bond and community buy-in. And I think that's real strategic of having the 30 plus meetings because it's the program need, but also the community need and stakeholder need um, of our campuses. Sure, and we did that all before. We had mm -hmm. multiple community stakeholder meetings, and um, unfortunately, some of the promises that were made were not kept. And so um, we don't have good community buy-in, I don't think, at this point. Um, but I could be wrong on that, and I hope I am, however, um, you know, the other thing that we had sort of talked about is having shovel-ready products projects so that we could get matching funds. I have not seen one matching fund delivered to this district we since 2012. And I know apparently we're queued up for those things, but we have not received a single dollar of state funds that we are entitled to. I think the depletion of the Prop 51 dollars, uh, but yes, we are have uh, approved applications. Now it's just the state, and I think that's why Governor Newsom and the legislature is pushing for the March 2020, so they could fund the the rest of the list that has already been pre-approved. But I think even the 15 billion that he's planning on releasing is still not going to cover the need, the great need that's out there. Correct. Um, it's and only I a fraction of what districts have already teed up. So I don't know where we are in that queue. I'm not sure, I still would like to have a presentation about how many of our projects have already been delivered to the DSA to get into that queue yeah. and how much we will be getting back at some point. I still am very unclear about that and I feel like all of this board needs to know that information. Okay. Just a reminder, that was five more minutes. Okay. This is a, a motion. I'd like to move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7-0. Um, I would also like to mo make a motion to extend the meeting to 11 o'clock, just mm -hmm. in case we need mm -hmm. that additional time. Yes. We need a second. I'll second. All those in favor till 11 o'clock? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. Opposed? opposed? Oh, all those opposed. Okay, all those opposed. So, excuse me. Aye. <clears throat> so that's six, six zero one. Six. Oh, six one. Okay, so let, we're gonna try to move on as quick as we can to the nine thank point. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. To the nine point one positive discipline community resources by Stephanie Barone. turn on my mic. I'd love to take a brief moment and just ask if everyone can join me in taking three breaths in. Three <sighs> breaths out. Three breaths in. Three breaths out. This is why we're important. Thank you all so much for all of your hard work tonight. The reason why positive discipline is really unique is because we provide adults an ability to make that conscious shift from dealing with and managing behavior as we hear so many of us are operating on that survival brain and really as to how to take moments as opportunities to learn and how to just be really mindful. I, um, we talk a lot about social emotional learning. We toss that around a lot, but what is it that we're putting in place to be able to help children do better when they feel better? What is it that we're doing for ourselves as adults, as parents, as educators, to be able to feel better and model that for our children? A little bit just about um, the way that I was able to really relate to Edward James Olmos, um, when he was so passionately talking about the importance of self-esteem, self-worth. What, uh, what, what does that mean? How is it that we're doing it? He talks about giving our children our best every day. Our motto here is we're all in every day, all of us, right? But how is it that we're doing that if we're not able to model the social and life skills that we're hoping for our children? 
just a little bit about myself. As a overworked, overstressed young parent, it was not feeling great being with my son, right? I was dealing with him. And when I finally had the courage to seek parenting classes and find, wow, you know what? I don't yet have the skills and tools that I need to be the best parent that I can be. And finding that it was so much easier to label him as the terrible twos, he was the one with the problem. But in just a little bit of positive discipline, I was immediately able to see that it was more about me. It was more about not knowing what self-care was. It was more about not understanding what was developmentally appropriate. And so that's something that I'm just so passionate and I'm just continuously falling down the rabbit hole and using my positionality to really inform my work as the director of positive discipline. Our strength lies in the ability to help all adults understand the urgency, to equip themselves, to model the behaviors, the social and life skills that we hope and pray that our children develop somewhere between the terrible twos and 18 years old. We really hope that in partnering with us, you let us breathe the joy and the understanding between the difference of punishment and discipline. Discipline is to guide. Let us guide parents. Let us help the educators to really breathe back in the respectful relationships and equitable relationships. We, um, PDCR promotes a model of interaction between children and adults that teaches respect and dignity, fosters a sense of belonging and significance, and brings more joy and compassion to family, schools, and our community. Just briefly, I, if you can go on to our next slide here. Um, you can, oh, okay. it's okay, just, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> and so I'll just fast forward. This is just a little bit of how we try and demystify the brain science, demystify what it means for when we're caught in a power struggle with our teenager, when we're caught in a power struggle with our spouse, right? We're firing off those mirror neurons. So when my toddler is having problems tying his shoes or having problems with tantrums or getting into the car, just moving from one transition to another, I'm able to understand why it is that I needed to escalate to a punitive practice because we're escalating each other and we're firing off each other. When he's tantruming, I immediately want to start tantruming too. And that is something that positive discipline is able to take away that shame, that blame, that guilt from parents and really just understand what it means to take a deep breath, right? With um, understanding ways to really promote this into as young as three, four years old as to what a flip lid is, this is brain science that we're able to bring to our classrooms. This is brain science we're able to bring to our parents to understand that when we're operating off of our big emotions and triggered from whatever it is that's happening at work, at school, in our life, is that we literally lose the ability to be in our thinking part of the brain, our prefrontal cortex. We're literally in the operating in that big emotion space and even more so for children who are not yet developed. When we're able to bring something as simple as this to a parent who's understanding that, they're able to have that conversation with their child in a nonverbal way to be like, this is what's happening at the grocery store, right? And helping to kind of bring that right back down. It's these simple tools that we're so excited to bring to families. We invite you to let us in, partner with us, support us. We're this little engine that could, that's bringing these really great resources to our community, whether that's through promotional support or bringing us into your school sites. We offer parenting classes, we have topical workshops, we have downloadable parenting tip sheets available free in English and Spanish. We do an, onu uh, an annual conference on special needs that's always affordable on a sliding scale fee with ASL and Spanish interpretation. We have trainings and professional development workshops that we offer annually. And we're just really excited to be here for our community because the goals that we all have, they don't have to be long term. We can be working toward those every day. And just in a, the last couple of seconds that I have, I just wanted to practice an experiential activity that we do with our parents. So it's called Do As I Say. So if you all could please indulge me. So do as I say. Put your finger on your head. Put your finger on your chin. What did that elicit for y'all? that I'm this crazy lady that's so stressed out that I don't know where my chin is or where my cheek is? No, it's that we're not modeling. We're saying, don't text and drive. And what is it that we're doing? We're on the email, we're checking while we're in traffic, right? What is these mixed messages? What is this mixed parenting styles that we have? And so again, it's just we're excited to be able to bring a little bit of that fun back and a little bit of that joy and that deeper understanding. So thank you all so much and I hope you're able to all get home to your families on time. <laughs> And I'll end there. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, I think both. <laughs> I, I have a couple comments. 
<clears throat> what partnerships do we currently have uh, with this organization at our school sites? Are there any? <clears throat> I'm not aware of any. Okay. So this Because I know we have a positive discipline, I know, at Calabasas, and maybe that's a little different than what your organization offers. Um, but for me, I think this is an excellent opportunity uh, to be more inclusive of our parents, right? Um, so if there's a way for us to build a partnership with this organization, be it have them host um, <clears throat> a workshop during our um, annual parenting conference, I think would be very beneficial. Um, like little things like that I think can go a long way. Um, so very much ways to, to get them involved um, with early childhood, our educators. I know um, Angelica has sent a couple of, uh, right, and so how can we expand that partnership, right? I always say that that's always the second home for a child, our preschools, our teachers, and so forth. So if they're also equipped, because I know you offer parent for parenting, but also a program for um, uh, preschool teachers, um, early education, right? Um, so in any way that we can partner for the benefit of our students, I think would go a long way. Um, um, what else? Even classes offered through adult ed, you know? Um, so things like that, because I think, you know, as a parent, I struggle. <laughs> Parenting is not easy and you want the best for your child. And I think having access to those tools can positively impact their upbringing um, and also their educational experience. So I think everything's connected. And the more we can um, increase parent involvement and the more tools we are able to provide to them, I think the better off our kids are gonna be when they uh, get into our schools. Um, so thank you so much for staying this late. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> you know, we, we were thinking it was going to be a shorter meeting, but um, but know that you do have my full support because I, I, I recognize the need for, for the services that you offer and hopefully by working with uh, our director, <laughs> um, we're able to expand and deliver the services to our parents. Thank you. I have a question for you. You base your philosophy off of Janet Lansbury, correct? Uh, Jane Nelson. Oh, so Jane Nelson. You Jane did? Nelson, an okay. Adlerian psychology. Okay. And so your philosophy is basically to teach the difference between discipline versus punishment. And correct? At, at its core, yeah. At its core. Yeah. Okay. For relationships. Yeah. Okay. And so are, does your method go into timeouts versus time-ins as well Definitely. as? Definitely. Okay. And so it's, uh, for us, it's more of like the cool down space. So how to use it in a way that's actually a part of the self-regulation and a coping method instead of being directed there. So when we say, okay, do you need to go to your cool down space? It's no longer a cool down space. It's now used as a punitive method. But when it's part of like, what can help you cool down? Like, you know, like just really curiosity questions. And they're like, I could probably go sit over there. And they're like, yeah, okay, we could try that. And it's you're making them feel that they're capable, right? Like we're, we're able to really draw that out of our kids at such an early age that they're really getting that as it's coined, Gemeinschaft fuel, that social interest that they can really be capable and in charge of what happens with them and problem solving. I actually have, uh, my question is directed at our superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez. Can um, you please explain to us, or me, um, what was the purpose of bringing this forward tonight as a report and discussion item? Sure. So um, as board members, you have the opportunity to provide um, requests to the agenda setting committee. So the request was brought to the agenda setting committee and it was approved. And so um, they are a community resource. And so they were here to explain the resource that they provide. Um, so that is the process that we take here in the school district to get something on the agenda. 
This is also not the first time you've presented to us because I do remember you presenting if maybe yeah, 2014. yeah I remember yeah, that maybe. presentation your hair was longer then yeah anyway thank you um, because I heard in the presentation a few times about partnering with and um, and it's no criticism to your program or w whether I personally agree, agree with it or disagree with it and I totally respect my colleague trustee um, Orozco's opinion on this but I think it's a, a very thin and fine line for us as a public K-12 educational system to partner and make with some organizations and make it suggestive to our stakeholders in this community that we are suggesting to them how they should parent their children. I think there's a place for this. I don't believe that it's appropriate that it comes from a free public K-12 educational system if it were through something on the adult side, through PEP classes, Cabrillo College, you know, um, community health trust, those types of things. I think that's more appropriately based. But coming from our, us as a public K, free public K-12 educational system, I, it's, it's crossing that very thin, fine line for me that you know border is saying we're we're telling parents in our community of how they should be parenting their children and i am not at all comfortable with that thank you so much i just said just for a minute um i think that being able to be a part of the menu of services that's offered as we are um, we are not the funded program we are not the um the free program and so what parents are currently receiving are you know either really like rewards based or punitive practices and you know, just as, as simple as like the planned ignoring or the timeouts. And so we're kind of on the philosophy that it should be a buffet, right? It isn't eat this broccoli because it's nutrition, but it's just like how do we just support parents and like the, the pieces that they're all struggling with that we even heard the desperation in the room and that we can be a partner in really just addressing some of that social, emotional, and just school community connectedness. And, and again, I'm not saying whether I agree or disagree with your program. I'm just saying, to me, for a free public K-12 educational system, this crosses a line to have a partnership when that could be facilitated through many other organizations in the community. So it does not come across to our parents of nearly 20,000 students, realize how many parents that is, that we are at all suggesting how they should be parenting their children. Well, I disagree, because I think we have a duty to prevent child abuse and we're stewards of children in this district. And I thank you both, especially you. She, she's great, by the way. Yeah, but no, um, for everything that you've done in our community to prevent child abuse. So thanks for the presentation. Good night. I just want to say thank you, too. You're, she's a good friend of mine. You and her, she and her husband are good friends of mine. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, when I was a director of a preschool center f for more than one of them, I, I wanted people like you to be there for our parents. I, I, I wanted you to be there for our parents. Yeah. So <laughs> what makes this? Go there we go. Um, I just wanted to reiterate some of the principal's comments um, that I've experienced in this community is the challenge they have is engaging parents in the active life of encouraging their students. And when it becomes a power struggle, there's the resistance and the pushing away. When they feel they belong and can problem solve together, the parents feel more engaged in that community. And I know Todd Westfall at, at Calabasas felt pretty strongly that when you have parents involved, you have students involved, and you have the teachers involved, that what you have is that triangulation so that it's a successful community that it supports the students for their greatest learning, which is pretty helpful. And then they believe in themselves and they can achieve. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Angelica, so have you used them? This particular? Uh-huh. Uh, or, and, and, and has, and has, you know, our other chair, director of the um, 
we do not have a collaboration with this organization, uh -huh. but this organization has a lot of resources uh -huh. available for the community and for parents to be able to get ideas yeah. on positive discipline. Yeah. We sen yeah. I sent a couple of coordinators, was the last month, I think, was a training, and they came really happy with the information they received. Yeah. Uh, we haven't implemented anything we're working at um, trying to put uh, the framework we use for social emotional development and some of these ideas together mm -hmm. so we can work with that. Yeah, sounds great. It's a 10 minute discussion, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so where are we? We're, we're at the consent agenda, right? Uh. I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda with deferring items 10.6, 10.11, 10.12, and 10.13. I'd like to second the motion. 10 point, so I, I, I can't remember all the ones we're deferring. Eva, do you need me to repeat that for you? Yeah. 10.6, okay. 10.11, 10.12, and 10.13. 10.6, 10.11, 10.12, and 10.13. Okay, do I have a second? I second. Okay, all, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So start with, is it 10.6? Yeah, I think this falls under Chona. No? no oh, oh, that's right, that's right. Um, so I, I guess my, my question was, is that why are we looking to make this agreement with CSUF? all the way over in Fresno instead of the Cal State systems that we have right here near us is particularly San Jose State. Because this is our, this is a, a school nursing agreement so we need to have a preceptor for one of our school nurses that has their preliminary credential and she's getting her preliminary credential through this program. So we are partnering with them so that she can finish her school nursing um, credential. Th this for one employee? Yes. Okay, so this isn't looking to be a partnership or an MOU agreement with the whole, this no. is just for one person who happens to be at that institution. Had she been at San Jose State, it would be, okay. Yeah, we would be looking at it differently. Okay, yes. that was my only question. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Thanks. So I'll make a motion to approve 10.6. Second. Uh, a second, we had second? Okay, mm -hmm. all those in favor? Aye. 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 So now we're at 10.10, .10, is that correct? 11. 10.11. Oh, um, so my question with 10.11, um, and it's, it's even, I don't know if, Joe, you want me to just deal with 10.12 because it's pretty much a similar question and avoid having to take the time to ask the same question twice. Um, I looked at these both and I'm wondering um, when did the district last look at um, other competitive pricing with this and seeking, looking at bidding this out and, you know, when was the last time? Let's just start with that. Yeah, the, the both agenda items are uh, a renewal right. and uh, the rates are, um, were negotiated. Uh, the district, um, I believe it was approximately five months ago that we did a presentation on uh, procurement uh, process for legal services and so we provided an outline to the board of um, our RFP and RFQ process and so we did provide an RFQ process uh, for legal services and so for the first item of, of Fagman Friedman uh, that is specific to our SELPA and special ed uh, right. services mm -hmm. and then the Dennis Walliver, Dennis Walliver Kelly is our facilities council uh, and purchasing uh, council. Um, so that was completed um, approximately about five months ago. We presented it to the board and, and we did an outline and a presentation on legal services. Um, we also provided an, uh, an assessment of other law firms that we contract with mm -hmm. that were specific for other areas. Well, and so, but due to the specific nature, how we have different law firms representing the district in different areas of specialties, so, I guess the question comes down to, I mean, how, are you comfortable with saying that these are competitively priced pricing 
and and because like particularly in the one not not the um, Friedman one but the um, the yeah Dennis Wolver, Wolliver and Kelly one I mean those are huge ranges so like with that one in particular what one of my more specific questions with that one is that I mean where are we falling in that range are we as a district constantly paying on the high end are we at the low end are we sometimes in the middle I mean what are you finding it's because the, that's quite a range it's actually in the the average so the the rates are the norm for similar districts and um, <clears throat> the law firms are, are pretty much by region so Bay Area uh, Central Coast uh, Southern California so these are the rates that similar sized districts receive um, I could try to negotiate a, a lower amount, but this is kind of the average what we see out there. One of the other things that we do as a district, and I'll be following up with uh, our SELPA department, is um, when we have specialty counsel and there's a, a co-founder or a partner, it's a higher rate. But if you right. have a non-partner uh, member of the law firm, then it's a lower rate. And so we really try to um, uh, guide the, the specialty services that we need to match the work. And so when we do need a additional expertise, then we'll call in a more experienced um, uh, someone that's guided within the law, so uh, overall. Well, for, for instance, the range that I'm speaking of, I, I understand what you're saying. Sure, if you have this level of counsel, you're paying this rate. If you have a special counsel or an associate or a clerk um, or a paralegal, you're paying this rate. But that's not the issue. For instance, the shareholders of council, that range is from 265 to 360. So my question to you was, are we constantly paying at that high rate? Are we sometimes at that low rate? Or are we sometimes landing in the middle? So I, just because I wanted to be accurate, I looked at the information we provided on June 26th, so I do have the answer for you, the exact answer. So our average hourly for um, FF, Triple F, which is the um, is 271, which is our average hourly rate that we pay. Um, DWK, which is the other um, contract in which you're referring to, is 259. But that's under an old contract. Um, so that was last year's yeah. rates. Yeah. So I guess so, that's not still really asking my question when we're having this range, because I don't have previous year's contract in front of me. So I don't know what that range was and how much it's changed to this one. So my, again, my question is, are we always at the highest end, at the lowest end, somewhere landing in the middle? Because I mean, this is a significant range. I would say we're- uh, On an hourly rate. On average is in the middle. Okay. So we're not on the high end and it's specific, it's case by case. But um, the presentation that we provided, it's a, it's a lower rate um, than what's anticipated. And, and part of the reason I'm asking these questions because it's, you know, besides being a due diligence issue, it's, you know, we, we don't want to have any vendor and even law firms that are, which are vendor, you know, of ours, getting complacent with us that, you know, oh, you know, that PBUSD, we could just charge them this because they don't even look outside of us and they're just going to renew their contract with us. Does, Correct. You understand what I'm saying? And one of the one of the items that we presented to the board previous was that, um, for example, in procurement, the district uh, lacked uh, front end documents or procurement documents. We got the templates uh, from Dennis Wallover Kelly. So now that we have those, we no longer need as much legal counsel to implement because that was a lot to to take on. So as we move forward, we just need to have those revised templates, and okay. our staff are fully capable of now moving that forward and you're looking at other pricing it, correct it got that for yes. okay so um president trustee osmondson i don't know if you it's okay if i could just adjoin it to approve 10.11 and 10.12 at the same time yeah that sounds good oh, let's just move yeah, on that or you want you want to yeah. do, it separate. do it separate okay separate. so then i'll make a motion to approve 10.11 i'll second all those in favor aye, aye. aye. all those opposed aye I'll make a motion to approve 10.12. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and so the last one, 10.13, uh, it's pretty much a similar um, question, Joe, with um, KPN. Um, you know, I, I, in the wording of the body of that, I read that it was 
competitive pricing. So my question to you is just how are you assured of that, that they have competitive pricing? Because this is a, a renewal of joining, not, again, something that sounds like we went out and said, you know, put us your bids of what we're going to do. So how are you assured that this is competitive pricing? So we do uh, um, analysis of, of pricing of similar equipment. I'll have Richard chime in as, as well. This is a JPA, so it's a pool of uh, similar entities, districts, and public entities that purchase the same uh, type of material or equipment or office supplies. And so that's where we get the price point or the price break uh, as a group. And so if you want to follow up on that, Richard. Um, I think the only thing that I would add is that we just uh, verify that um, when we go in with something like this, a, a piggyback with KPN, that it was awarded in accordance with California laws and that it was bid out the way that we would do it ourselves if, if we were to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just taking advantage of saving the time of us having to process the bid and the award. And so yeah. you're not necessarily <coughs> sure that the pricing of the equipment, you're just talking about that process, but is the, I'm saying the competitive pricing with the equipment that we're purchasing. So, the, um, so we're not purchasing any equipment, it'd just be the supplies that are going or the supplies. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, we're assured that the process was competitive and that it was awarded so that it's um, the absolute lowest that we could get um, for our area. And it packaging is. it this way actually avoids using legal counsel to assist the district in developing our own RFP. Mm -hmm. So this is an example, a great example of not using legal counsel but using an established um, bid from another district or another entity uh, to piggyback on and get the price point that we would like. Okay, thank you for the um, elaboration on it. So with that, I'll make a motion to approve item 10.13. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, <clears throat> are we done now? So I wanna go to the deferred consent items. That was it. Oh. Oh, oh, no, not deferred consent items. Sorry. I, I don't know what I was talking about. I, I, I want to go to closed session. Uh, motion number one, closed session item 2.2. .2. I move to approve the certificated personal report as presented by district administration on October 9th, 2019 with 28 and 3 additional action items. All Second. those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion number two, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on October 9th, 2019 with two and five additional action items. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Is that it? No, no, we're not All voting right. on it. So oh, we oh, voted in, indoors, but yeah. we're reporting out. Yeah, we're reporting um, out. So the board approved a uh, full expulsion uh, for the remainder of the 1920 school year with placement at another school outside the district on a strict behavior contract for the following students, 1920 004, 1920 005, and 1920 006 with a 502 vote. Okay. <clears throat> Upcoming meetings, our next scheduled meeting is on Wednesday, October 23rd here.